the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's love. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 245, Ezekiel 8-11, Jerusalem in the Vision The evils of Jerusalem which were conveyed to the people of South Judah in Babylon made them foresee Jerusalem's destruction. First point, God showed Ezekiel the four types of idol worship that the people of South Judah were carrying out through visions. During the sixth year in Babylon, as a captive, Ezekiel saw a vision whilst he was in his home. This was the fourth vision with a vision above the bolts. God took Ezekiel to the inner section of the Jerusalem temple and through to the door on the north. Here, God showed Ezekiel four types of idols inside the Jerusalem temple. On the north side of the temple, the idol of jealousy was erected. Second, were the idols that the 70 elders of Israel and the priests were worshipping. This was a pitiful sight of the elders, and even the priests were secretly worshipping idols whilst burning the incense for God. Third was the idol that the women served just outside the temple door, the idol called Tammuz. Tammuz was the idol that Babylon and a few other countries served, and it represented abundance. The fourth was the god of the sun, which around 25 people worshipped in front of the temple and also in between the altars. This was where only the priests were permitted to stay, but these people worshipped an idol in this area, which was indeed a serious sin. As such, God showed Ezekiel all these disgusting sins that were taking place within the Jerusalem temple. And now the people were unable to escape God's judgment. Second point, Moses, Ezekiel, and Paul all had times when they cried out to God. God showed Ezekiel the people worshipping idols in the Jerusalem temple through visions and now declared their judgment. But the amazing thing was that despite such circumstances, God still distinguished those whom he would save. God showed whom he would save with a sign on their head in order to distinguish them. This sign on the head in Ezekiel later appears again in Revelation. This was God showing that, excluding those who had the sign on their heads, the last were idol worshippers, and God would judge them. According to the laws in a kingdom of priests, if the priest had touched a dead body, they were unable to enter God's dwelling place. God told them to fill the temple with dead bodies in his anger towards Jerusalem. To this, Ezekiel cried out to God. In the past, Moses had a pride for the people who had made and worshipped the golden calf. Some time later, Paul also cried for the people. This time, despite Ezekiel's prayer for the people, God did not change his mind to judge. Their sins were too severe that it was impossible for them to escape their punishment. Third point. Ezekiel's ministry was focused on God's glory. Despite Ezekiel's pleading to God for the people, God still showed him the judgment of burning coals that was to come upon Jerusalem. This was a pre-show of how Jerusalem was to burn down in the hands of Babylon. After showing Ezekiel the vision of the burning coal, he then showed Ezekiel his glory. The reference to the groups here were those who were living near the Keba River. Fourth point, during God's vision, Ezekiel saw the idol worship in Jerusalem as well as the people's misunderstanding towards God. The people who were left in Jerusalem 
after the first and second round of captives still believed that God was protecting them from Babylon. Amongst them, 25 leaders of South Judah stood out to Ezekiel. God declared that they were the ones who were leading the evil in Jerusalem. These leaders who were appointed by God were telling the people that South Judah would not fall. These leaders changed Jeremiah's waters of the boiling pot and twisted them to proclaim that Jerusalem would grow stronger and that the flames would protect them. God followed them and strongly declared that he would destroy South Judah. God continued to speak to Ezekiel. God confirmed the four of these 25 leaders through the metaphor of a killing and meat. And when one of the 25 died, Ezekiel prayed to God for the remaining people. Amidst such a serious situation, there were still people who did not recognize God's will and misunderstood that God would protect them until the end. God showed Ezekiel how these people misunderstood and then explained that through the 70 years in Babylon, they would be able to become re-established as a good fix in a kingdom of priests. Fifth point, to the people of South Judah who were dispersed, God told Ezekiel that he would be their holy prize for a short while. God told Ezekiel that although he had scattered the people of South Judah in Babylon, he would nevertheless provide for them his dwelling. God furthermore promised that when the 70 years came to an end, the people of South Judah would be restored as a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. In other words, the 70 years in Babylon had already been decided, and once that time was over, the people would be able to restore their relationship with God. Ezekiel understood God's will and continued his life near the Keba River and delivered God's message to the people. Day 246, Ezekiel 12 to 14. All visions are gone. The false prophets preached the false peace. Disregarding the 70 years, God had foretold them and merely shouted empty consolation. First point, God said that Ezekiel's performance represented South Judah's confirmed punishment. In order to show that God's judgment on South Judah had been confirmed, God commanded Ezekiel to perform symbolic acts, and the first was to symbolize the exiles. The people of South Judah, who were already in Babylon, were not interested in listening to anything or anyone. Thus, God told Ezekiel to go forth and perform an act for them to see and be persuaded. Therefore, per God's command, Ezekiel packed his belongings for exile, and in the daytime set out and walked around as the people watched. And then in the evening, he went out like an exile, while the people were watching. This was a warning that South Judah would fall, and that the remaining people would be taken as captive to Babylon. Not long afterwards, God's orders were fulfilled. Jerusalem was attacked during the night by the Babylonian soldiers, and the soldiers seized Zedekiah as well as the people. Zedekiah was brought to Babylon, where he spent the rest of his life. In the middle of this, God still planned salvation for the remaining people in Jerusalem. Now God commanded Ezekiel to carry out the second act. This time he was to tremble as he ate his food and shudder in fear as he drank water. This was to show how the people will eat their food in anxiety and drink water in despair as their land are stripped of everything. It was here that Jeremiah cried out to God. It was almost time for South Judah to fall and for the remaining people 
to be taken as captives and for the land of Jerusalem to have its 70 years of Sabbath. Second point, the saying, the days go by and every vision comes to nothing, was spreading in South Judah during those times. It was most unfortunate that despite the fall of South Judah approaching quickly, the saying, the days go by and every vision comes to nothing, was spreading. God therefore told Ezekiel to set their thinking straight. This line of thought came from what Jeremiah had proclaimed a while ago. The South Judah would fall as time progressed. The people thought that this prophecy was a lie and that the visions came to nothing. What they did not consider was that the end of South Judah was just around the corner. The people said that Ezekiel's vision was for many years from now and that he prophesied about the distant future. God replied that the delay would be no longer. Third point, the reason the false prophets during those days lied was because they wanted to receive a handful of grain. God warned Ezekiel of what was to happen to the false prophets. God referred to those who acted according to their own will and the foolish who followed their own spirits. God referred to these people as jackals. God referred to various people as jackals and whitewashed tombs in the Bible, and these were usually those who interfered with God's work. God declared judgment on the false prophet. The first was that they would not be able to enter the Jerusalem assembly. The second was that they would not be recorded in the name of the Israelites. The third was that they would not be able to come into the land of the Israelites. God pointed out that these false prophets told lies for money. God proclaimed that they would be removed from the Israelites. Fourth point, the elders who served both the idols and God came to Eskia. God declared the punishment upon the idol worshippers through Eskia. Around this point, the elders of Israel who worshipped idols came to Eskia. They were the ones who worshipped idols and also God. But to God, these people only worshipped the idols and pretended to worship God on the surface. Therefore, when the elders came to ask for something to Ezekiel, they were turned down. This was because no one could appear to God before repenting their sins. Fifth point, God declared that even if Noah, Daniel, or Job were among the people of South Judah that would not change God's decision to punish them. God explained in detail to Ezekiel of his judgment against South Judah. The first was that there would be famine upon South Judah. The second was that there would be judgment on the wild beasts. Third was the judgment of the swords. Fourth was plague judgment. Thus, as the judgment had been decided, God told Ezekiel that there was no point in praying for the people. God added that even if Noah, Daniel, and Job, who were considered the most righteous during their time, prayed for these people, the result could not be changed. God explained that anyone who repented would become God's remnant. Through Ezekiel, God declared that these remnants would be able to return as a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests after 70 years in Babylon. Day 247, Ezekiel 15 to 17. The promise of the Old and New Covenant. The people of South Judah should have followed God, but they did not show any intention to turn away from evil or to repent. First point, through the metaphor of a grape tree which cannot produce fruit, 
God told Ezekiel of his judgment for South Judah. God had planted a grape tree called South Judah, but the fruit became useless with no edible grapes. God used the metaphor of a grape tree to Isaiah beforehand also. The reason grape trees are valuable is due to the fruits they produce. This was the same for God's people. The reason God's people were considered valuable was due to their patience, meekness, endurance, and love. A grape tree with no grapes is no longer considered valuable. God used this metaphor to explain the state of the people of South Judah. A tree with no fruit no longer has any use. It can only be used as a fireplace log. The people of South Judah who did not keep their mission in a kingdom of priests were told by God that their fate would be like the grape tree with no grapes. Second point. God told Ezekiel that although God looked after them as if they were orphans, they still criticized God. God declared that he raised the south of Judah who had been like orphans. Since the day of Exodus, God had taken the Israelites into his hands and nurtured them. God nurtured them so well that they had become fruitful and multiplied abundantly. God had envisioned them becoming his holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. God continued to use the metaphor of a marriage to explain the sins of South Judah. South Judah had become like a queen due to God's nurturing, and they were treated as a queen by their surrounding countries. But the people forgot about this and went ahead with their idol worship and adultery. The people went as far as to offer sacrifices to their idols. They also expanded their idol range to foreign gods, served by Egypt, Philistine, Assyria, Tyre, and so on. Therefore, God declared that they would be invaded by foreign countries. They would also be raided and their towns burned down. God told them, that they were now the same as the foreign countries. God added that their sins were greater than those of Sodom and Gomorrah in the past. As such, God outlined the exact sins of the people through metaphors, but then he added that even they would be restored through God's salvation. Third point. God remembered the promise he made with South Judah and declared that he would restore them and give them a new covenant. The sins of South Judah were so despicable that it was difficult even to list them. Despite this, God still remembered that they were the descendants of Abraham and so promised them a new covenant. This new covenant had its foundation in the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was built through God's grace and was therefore called the Grace Covenant. This was the covenant God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God also made a covenant with David. The next covenant was the one made between God and the people of Israel called the Bilateral Covenant, and this was based on conditions. This covenant was made on Mount Sinai and the main content was for the people to agree in becoming holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. God added that if the people broke their side of the covenant, they would be punished in three different stages according to the law. God explained that after receiving punishment, if they accepted this and repented, he would renew his covenant. The covenant became completely fulfilled later through Jesus Christ. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Fourth point, God spoke to the people of South Judah through allegories and metaphors. Now, God spoke to Ezekiel through the metaphor of two eagles and a grape tree. 
The reason God used allegories and metaphors were firstly to explain that Babylon, which was like a huge eagle, would take Jehoiachin and the people of South Judah as captive. The second was to explain that Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would take King Zedekiah from South Judah and rule over him. The third was that South Judah would want to make an alliance with another eagle, Egypt, to rely on them. The fourth was that relying on Egypt would only make things worse for South Judah. All these allegories and metaphors were recorded by Ezekiel. Zedekiah had made an alliance with Egypt in order to fight against Babylon. But of course, this did not work out. Therefore, Zedekiah had to be taken to Babylon. The reason God used allegories and metaphors of two eagles and a grape tree was in order to symbolize South Judah struggling between Babylon and Egypt. What they failed to see was that God was testing them through Babylon. South Judah was not to choose Babylon or Egypt. They were to choose God only. But they only relied on the empires, which seemed more powerful to them. They also had no inclination to repent. This is exactly what God was pointing out. Fifth point, God gave Ezekiel the metaphor of a cedar to reveal how South Judah would eventually be saved by the Messiah. This time, God used the metaphor of a cedar to Ezekiel. This message contained the words of the coming of the Messiah and the salvation that was to follow. Day 248, Ezekiel 18 to 20. Ezekiel's metaphor of the two lions. God, who judged each person according to his deeds, commanded the people to depart from all sins and to renew their mind and spirit. First point The people of South Judah, who were taken as captives, blamed their ancestors for their fate. The people of South Judah, who were taken as captive to Babylon, had the following misunderstanding about God. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents ate sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Jeremiah, who heard this in Jerusalem, convinced the people that this was their misunderstanding. The people thought that they were taken for the sins of their fathers and ancestors in order to tell the people that this was a misunderstanding. God told them about the righteous father and the sinner son. The sinner son was surely to die. The second was about the righteous son and the sinner father. The righteous son was to live and the sinner father was to die for his sins. The righteous person that God referred to was firstly someone who served only God. The second was someone who lived a clean life. The third was someone who protected their neighbors. The fourth was someone who lived according to justice and righteousness. The fifth was someone who kept God's laws. As such, God explained to the people that it was due to their sins that they were being punished. Furthermore, God told the people who wished to leave Babylon as soon as possible that they were to stay there for 70 years. This was because the 70 years in Babylon represented punishment and education. Second point, God declared that he did not find joy in the evil perishing. Despite proclaiming judgment on South Judah, through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, God still waited for the people of South Judah to repent. God explained that if the righteous sinned, then they would also be put to death. God furthermore explained to the people that their misunderstanding was to be fixed. The reason the people complained so much was because they could not accept their punishment. 
they believed that God was not powerful enough to save them from the Babylonian Empire, and that they were being punished for the sins of their ancestors. Ezekiel was to explain to the captives who were already taken to Babylon of Jeremiah's message. He also told the people to repent. Third point, God spoke of the fall of South Judah through the metaphor of the two lions and the vineyard. God commanded Ezekiel to come up with a lamenting song for the officials of South Judah. Ezekiel wrote five lamenting songs in total. The first was the lament for South Judah. The second was the lament for Tyre. The third was also the lament for Tyre. The fourth was a continuation of the lament for Tyre. The fifth was the lament for Egypt. The lament for South Judah in chapter 19 brought to surface the seriousness of God's judgment on them. David's descendants had become like burnt grapes. God gave the metaphor of two lions to illustrate the fall of South Judah. The two lions here represented Jehu Ahaz and Jehoiachin, and the grape tree represented the last king Zedekiah. Regarding Jehu Ahaz, God explained that he would be taken to Egypt and he would die there. And for Jehoiachin, he would be taken to Babylon, where he would be sent to prison for 37 years. Although he would be set free after this time, he would not be able to return to Jerusalem. The metaphor of the grape tree was in reference to Zedekiah. Zedekiah would be dragged to Babylon and South Judah would completely fall. All of God's words soon became fulfilled. Fourth point, God told the elders who came to Ezekiel during captivity of their rebellious history. To the elders of Israel who came to Ezekiel, God told them of their rebellious history and how their question to God in itself was inadequate. God explained how the people forgot about the covenant God made with them 900 years ago on Mount Sinai and continuously worshipped idols. They did not listen to God's prophets and all they focused on was idol worship. The people not only worshipped idols, but they went as far as to offer long offerings. But these people came to ask God why they were being punished. And so God told them that they had no right to confront God. God once again confirmed that their judgment had been made and finalized. Fifth point. God told Ezekiel that the 70 years in Babylon would be filled with punishment and education. Through Ezekiel, God explained how South Judah would fall, how Babylon would take them as a captive, and how after 70 years in Babylon, they would be able to return. God went through his relationship with South Judah and warned them of their time to come in Babylon. Although they would be taken as a captive to Babylon, God would still hold on to his covenant and ensure that the 70 years was filled with punishment and education. God furthermore told them that after 70 years, they would be able to return as a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. God's words were fulfilled 70 years later. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. God then went on to give Ezekiel the metaphor of the burning wood to symbolize the burning down of Jerusalem. The reference to the south side of the forest referred to the land of South Judah for the people who were already taken to Babylon. God's reference to all the south and north referred to the entirety of South Judah and North Israel. 
Day 249, Ezekiel 21-22. The Lord's Sword. God's spokesman Ezekiel pointed out the evils of Jerusalem, predicted its final day, and declared the punishment South Judah would receive with a regrettable mind. First point. God told Ezekiel to cry out to the point of his hips, becoming disjointed. In Ezekiel chapter 20, God used the metaphor of the burning forest to explain how the people of South Judah would be taken as captive to Babylon. God explained by describing the south of the forest, the holy place in the Jerusalem temple, as well as the grounds of South Judah. God declared that he was to cut off the righteous and the wicked with his sword, which will be unsheathed against the people from south to north. God concluded that South Judah's fall was quickly emerging. Second point, God told Ezekiel to sing the Song of Swords. God declared his judgment through the sword. This showed how very dangerous God's sword was. God's weapon and tool of choice was the Babylonian soldiers, and they were to attack against Ammon, Tyre, and South Judah. Babylon had selected South Judah as their target. As such, South Judah was to fall in the hands of Babylon. By emphasizing three times that they would kneel down, God confirmed that South Judah was to fall. God also added the message of the coming of Messiah. God declared that his sword would be used against Ammon also. As mentioned, this was because Ammon were pleased to see that Babylon had attacked South Judah. Five years after the fall of South Judah, Ammon was also to fall. Third point, God pointed out the sins of the princes and leaders of South Judah. God explained to Ezekiel exactly why the people of South Judah had to be punished. This was firstly because of idol worship. The second was due to the officials of South Judah. As such, God revealed the sins of the princes of South Judah, as well as the leaders who led the people to the evil. Fourth point, South Judah was to be punished for their sins and then become purified. God once again told Ezekiel of the sins of Jerusalem. God declared that the sins of Jerusalem equated to the sins of Nineveh. God had previously outlined the sins of Jerusalem during the days of King Josiah through the prophet Jephaniah. As declared by Jephaniah, now it was really time for God's judgment. We come back to God's warning in Leviticus 26. I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. God then went on to explain that the people were to be punished and educated for 70 years. Fifth point. God once again pointed out the sins of the various people groups in South Judah. Son of man, say to the land, You are a land that has not been cleansed or rained on in the day of wrath. God declared that South Judah made their grounds into one that was not provided with rain due to their sins. God furthermore outlined the sins of the false prophets priests, officials, and the people of South Judah. God mentioned how the priests had neglected their roles, how the officials sinned, and also how the people sinned. As such, all the people had each sinned, and thus were unable to escape God's judgment. South Judah resembled Sodom and Gomorrah back in the days. Day 250 Ezekiel 23-24 Parable of the Port Samaria and Jerusalem, which were saturated with evil, did not hear God's exhortation and persuasion, and so were destroyed by Assyria and Babylon. First point, 
through the metaphor of the two sisters, Ohola and Oholiba, God pointed out how Israel had relied on other empires and foreign idols rather than God. God spoke to Ezekiel through the metaphor of the sisters, Ohola and Oholiba. These two sisters were symbolized as God's wives. Ohola symbolized Samaria, and Oholiba symbolized Jerusalem. God first spoke of Samaria through Ohola. God explained how North Israel worshipped the idols of Egypt and Assyria. In other words, with Jeroboam, the people started to commit all sorts of sins. As such, North Israel worshipped so many idols that they eventually fell in the hands of Assyria. Next, God spoke of Jerusalem through Oholiba. South Judah went directly in the way of North Israel by worshipping all the foreign idols. They worshipped the Assyrian idols. The person to rely and worship Assyria the most was King Ahaz. They also worshipped the Babylonian idols and then Egyptian idols. When South Judah was young, they relied on Egypt, but they went too far as to worship the Egyptian idols. Second point, God pointed out that South Judah followed in the ways of North Israel, which collapsed. God spoke of how South Judah was to be punished. As explained previously in the book of Kings, Jerusalem was to fall in the hands of Babylon. God declared that through their fall, they would no longer be able to worship foreign idols. Your rudeness and promiscuity have brought this on you, because you lusted after the nations and defied yourself with their idols. You have gone the way of your sister, so I will put her cup into your hands. God went on to outline the faults of Jerusalem and Samaria, the sins of North Israel and South Judah, especially regarding the Jerusalem temple and Sabbath, were emphasized. The first of their sin was that they made sacrifices to idols. The second was that they did wrong during Sabbath and also made the temple an unclean place. Third, they offered God's incense to foreign gods and also used it for other activities. Fourth, they followed in the evil ways of their surrounding countries. Thus, South Judah, much like North Israel, could not escape their punishment. Third point, when Babylon attacked South Judah for the third time, God made Ezekiel carry out the performance of Jerusalem at the cooking port. Son of Man recorded this date, this very date, because the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. Tell these rebellious people a parable and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, put on the cooking pot, put it on and pour water into it. Eighteen months from this day, Jerusalem was to fall. God told Ezekiel to carry out the symbolic performance of Jerusalem as a cooking pot. The first thing God told Ezekiel to do was to put the cooking pot over the fire. The lost pot was a reference to Jerusalem, and the meat inside symbolized the people of South Judah. The fire symbolized Babylon, which was to be used as God's tool. God intended to burn down Jerusalem. Next, God commanded Ezekiel to set the empty pot on the coals until it became hot and the copper glowed. This was God burning down lust until it disappeared. God then told Ezekiel to burn down the disgusting idol worship. First point, God made his prophets at the time carry out symbolic performances and to use metaphors in order to make the people understand. The symbols used by the prophets in the Bible were the best expressions of the circumstances and the God's messages of the time. The prophets used various symbolic acts and measures. To look at a few, Isaiah performed the symbolic act of bare body and bare feet, which was a means to make South Judah stop relying on Egypt and Cush. 
Jeremiah did the performance of the rope and the yoke, which symbolized that the people were to take on the yoke and to surrender to Babylon. As for Ezekiel, he did the symbolic act of the cooking pot, which symbolized the purification of the people's sins. If the lust was not burned down, then it would not be able to disappear. Thus, a thorough purification was needed in order to restore the descendants of Abraham who did not keep their covenant with God for the past 900 years, God decided to purify them. Even if the most fresh and clean ingredients are used, if the cooking pot is dirty, then the outcome cannot be great. As such, God had plans to purify the core of Jerusalem and to re-establish the descendants of Abraham as a holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. Seventy years was needed for this task. Fifth point, God told Ezekiel not to cry over or lament over his wife's death, but to quietly grieve. God spoke of South Judah's fall through the death of Ezekiel's wife. This symbolized how Jerusalem would suddenly fall. For this, God took away Ezekiel's wife, who provided him with joy. God told him not to be sad or to lament. For Ezekiel, this was indeed a heartbreaking instant. Through the death of his wife, Ezekiel was able to further feel the pain of the fall of South Judah, which was soon to happen. He was moreover able to realize the sadness of God. The reason God gave Ezekiel such sadness was in order for him to realize God's pain and heartache deeper. Day 251, Ezekiel 25-28 The Fall of Tyre The arrogant countries who believed that they controlled everything with their own power eventually disappeared into history. First point, God who declared that the whole world was his now proclaimed punishment on South Judah's surrounding countries, Ammon, Moab, Edom, and Philistine. God explained to Ezekiel that Ammon would be judged for their sins. The reason for their judgment was because when Babylon attacked South Judah, they did not stop them but later enjoyed this. Ammon, Moab, North Israel, and South Judah were brother nations. However, when they saw the fall of South Judah, they did not lament, but rather enjoyed this. God saw this as evil, and so, five years later, Ammon too was conquered by Babylon. God continued to outline how Ammon was to fall. God was not pleased to see Ammon treat the people of South Judah, who were appointed as holy citizens in a kingdom of priests, like any other foreign nation. God then continued to declare judgment on Edom. The reason for Edom's punishment was when Ammon and Moab enjoyed the fact that South Judah had fallen, Edom went further and helped Babylon to attack them. God therefore judged them for this. God declared that he would look upon Edom as enemies and punish them. God next proclaimed judgment on Philistine. The reason for Philistine's judgment was because from the early days, they had despised and attacked South Judah. Therefore, God called Edom and Philistine his enemies and announced that they would also fall. Second point, Tyre rejoiced when their trade rival South Judah fell in the hands of Babylon, but what they did not know was that they too were to fall in the hands of the Hellenistic Empire. Regarding Tyre's fall, God outlined what was to happen to Ezekiel. The reason for their fall was because they were glad that Jerusalem's prophets would come to them. Although Tyre had good relations with Jerusalem during the days of David and Solomon by providing them with the tools 
for the temple construction, they sinned afterwards and were unable to avoid their punishment. Being located conveniently near the sea, they saw many benefits from trade and became very wealthy. However, their wealth made them arrogant. Moreover, when Jerusalem, which was the heart of international trade, fell, they were excited of the profits that were to come to them. However, God saw this as evil and therefore declared judgment. What Tyre failed to see was the growing power of Babylon. Moreover, they were unable to see how God was the one who governed the world. They were absolutely certain that they would not perish. They clearly did not think that their days were also limited. God declared that Tyre's fall would be unexpected even for their surrounding countries. Tyre was conquered by Babylon and they completely perished and the Alexander of the Hellenistic Empire. As declared by God, Tyre was no longer able to stand after this. Third point, Ezekiel outlined the glory that Tyre saw due to their successes in international trade. Ezekiel chapter 27 was the second lamenting song for Tyre. Tyre was once a prosperous country. The metaphor of a lavish boat made of the finest materials was used to symbolize their past glory. All their glory was built through their international trade. Countries and countries traded with Tyre and also wished to be associated with them. Many countries brought their finest materials to trade with Tyre. This was because Tyre had a lot of excellent materials at hand. But God declared to Tyre that they would no longer be able to stand. Tyre had become arrogant and thought that all things belonged to them. They had forgotten that all things belonged to God. Fourth point, God declared that Tyre's sudden fall would surprise many countries that traded with them. God told Ezekiel that Tyre would perish. Tyre's surrounding countries would lament over their fall. Unlike other countries, God pointed out that Tyre would completely perish. Tyre's abundance and prosperity was unquestionable. They had gathered their fortune through their abilities in trade, but their wealth was not to withstand forever. God declared their destruction and told Ezekiel to sing a lamenting song for them. This was a warning to them that they would not be able to hold the fortune, that God had permitted them forever. Fifth point, God declared that the reason for Tyre's fall was due to the king of Tyre's arrogance. God told Ezekiel of his judgment against the king of Tyre. The reasons can be found in Ezekiel 28 verses 2 to 6. The ultimate reason was down to the fact that the king of Tyre was arrogant. He believed that he was a god and that he was wiser than Daniel and that all Tyre's wealth was accomplished through his wisdom. Therefore, God told Ezekiel to sing a lamenting song for the king of Tyre. In the past, the king of Tyre was indeed wise and Tyre was beautiful like the Garden of Eden. The king of Tyre was blessed by God, but God's blessing in time made the king arrogant. Thus, this arrogance led to his downfall. Next, God declared judgment on Sidon. Sidon and Tyre were both city-states of Phoenicia. The reason for Sidon's judgment was not outlined in detail, but we can presume that it was due to their idol worship. Sidon's fall was spoken by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, and also Ezekiel. After speaking of Ty and Sidon's fall, God returned to the topic of South Judah's restoration. Day 252 Ezekiel 29-32 Finding no joy in the evildoer's death. 
although Egypt should have remembered God, who was the source of blessing, they were not humble and so were judged for their arrogance. First point, God provided various metaphors to emphasize Egypt's judgment. In Ezekiel chapters 29 to 32, God dedicated a full four chapters into explaining the judgment of Egypt using metaphors. God said that Egypt was like a great monster lying among the streams and outlined the reasons for their punishment. Egypt was so arrogant that they believed that they were the creators of the river. They believed that the abundance God gave them through the Nile was their own achievement. Thus, God declared punishment on them. God moreover claimed that Egypt was like a staff of reed. The fall of Egypt was already declared by God through the prophet Isaiah during the reign of King Hezekiah. Isaiah also said that Egypt was like a staff of reed. When Babylon had conquered of Assyria and was continuing to conquer their other surrounding countries, South Judah thought it would be best to make an alliance with Egypt. They had a false hope that Egypt would become their ally. But God told Isaiah to tell the people that Egypt was like a useful staff. Nevertheless, South Judah still did all they could to make an alliance with Egypt. However, Egypt did not help them, but instead brought upon further distress. What the people of South Judah should have done was to turn to God, who had incomparable powers to Egypt. To the people who looked to Egypt, God told them what was to happen. God explained that Egypt was to endure hardship for the next 40 years, and even when they could become restored, they would never again see their full glory. As such, God declared judgment on Egypt for their arrogance. God made Babylon take over Egypt. Babylon tried to conquer Tyre after South Judah, but they did not see good results, and so turned to Egypt. This ultimately destroyed Egypt. Second point, on the day of God's righteous judgment, Babylon's army was to strike Egypt. God told Ezekiel about the day of judgment for Egypt and the countries who made alliances with Egypt. God outlined the plagues that would appear on this day to Egypt, as well as to the countries that made alliances with them. In other words, the countries that made alliances with Egypt would all be destroyed and taken over by Babylon. God proclaimed that Babylon, which was the most brutal of them all, would strike Egypt. And on that day of God's judgment, the cities of Egypt will know that they fell in the hands of Babylon because of God's judgment. The first round of the Egyptian fall occurred in 605 BC, during the battle against Babylon when the Egyptian king died. And the second round was when Babylon attacked for the second time after striking down South Judah. God warned of his management of the world through Babylon's 70-year reign. Third point, God told Ezekiel about the arrogance of Egypt compared with Assyria. God compared Egypt's glory to Assyria's past glory to Ezekiel. Assyria was once a strong and powerful nation. Assyria's glory that God reported to pointed to the time when they had held power over Asia for 520 years. Assyria's past glory was so phenomenal that even God's cedar wood and the trees of the Garden of Eden envied them. As such, God compared Egypt to Assyria. Assyria was once extraordinarily powerful, but their arrogance became even greater than their power. Assyria's end was a warning of Egypt's end. In other words, Egypt was headed in the way of Assyria. First point, through the fall of Egypt, God once again revealed how the whole world belongs to him. God commanded Ezekiel to sing a lamenting song for the king of Egypt. 
The lamenting song in Ezekiel chapter 32 was God's words after a year since the fall of South Judah. Two years ago, God reported to Egypt as a great monster, and now, once again, God spoke of their destruction. The reason for Egypt's judgment was because of their arrogance. Through this, God once again declared how the whole world belongs to him. God repeatedly mentioned that through his judgment, the people will know that he is the Lord. God declared that for a long time, he looked to Egypt and hoped that they would turn to him. But now they would see God through a painful way. Egypt now faced a brutal and pitiful end. Fifth point, through the context of a kingdom of priests, God declared that he does not want the evil to perish, but wants them to turn from their ways. God now told Ezekiel of the conclusions of his judgment for each of the countries. The first was the death of Egypt. The second was the death of the Assyrian Empire. The third was the death of Elam. The fourth was the death of Meshach and Tubal. The fifth was the death of Edom and Sidon. As Tyre had not yet fallen at this point, only Sidon appears to be mentioned. The sixth was the death of the Pharaoh of Egypt. As such, God declared the fall of Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistine, Tyre, Sidon, Egypt, and so on, and once again rebuilt how the whole world belongs to him. God, who governed the whole world with justice, did not distinguish or favor South Judah over others. As Levi, out of the thirteen sons of Jacob, lived to serve the other twelve tribes, South Judah was also there in order to serve their surrounding countries. But the people of South Judah were unable to fulfill their duties in a kingdom of priests and were therefore punished for it. And thus, God revealed his heart to Ezekiel regarding this matter. God declared that he did not wish to see the evil perish, but for them to turn from their evil ways and repent. In other words, he did not actually want to punish them. All in all, through the prophets, we can see just how much God wanted to save them and just how much God wanted his people to repent and turn from their evil ways. Day 253, Ezekiel 33 to 35, Prophets and Watchmen. God, the source of true hope, said, I am your God, to the captives in Babylon, who heard the terrible news of Jerusalem's destruction. First point, the atmosphere in the book of Ezekiel changes in chapter 33 with the news of the fall of Jerusalem. After 18 months of waiting, Babylon finally broke into Jerusalem. Now South Judah completely fell. This news reached the people of South Judah who had been taken to Babylon during the first and second round of captivity. At this point, God gave Ezekiel the task of a watchman once again. Before Jerusalem fell, God had given Ezekiel the task and responsibility of a watchman. Indeed, this showed the hefty responsibility of a prophet. The duties of the watchman Ezekiel was not so much to be responsible for the future of the people, but to deliver God's message and to warn the people of danger. If Ezekiel told the people, but they did not listen, the responsibility was on the people. However, if the watchman did not warn the people, this was the responsibility of the watchman. Ezekiel, who became appointed as God's watchman, now had to deliver the message of God. He also had to tell them God's heart as the people misunderstood it. The standard of God's judgment was simple. Even if a righteous person sinned, they would die. And if the evil repented, then they would be saved. God declared that whoever repented and turned from their evil ways would be able to live. Second point, 
when Jerusalem became attacked by Babylon, the people of South Judah, who ignored Ezekiel's message, suddenly came to listen to Ezekiel. During the 12th year since the second group of captives were taken to Babylon, the Babylonian soldiers attacked Jerusalem. The captives who were already in Babylon heard this news. As soon as Ezekiel heard this, he started to deliver God's message to the captives. God told the people that as they did not repent right until the end, they would have to live in Babylon for 70 years. Although the people of South Judah in Babylon had ignored Ezekiel's words beforehand, when this news broke, they came to him. This did not mean that their attitudes had changed. The people in Babylon listened to the words of Ezekiel as a right warning and did not repent. God, however, said that they would listen on the day God's words came true. Third point, God used the metaphor of a shepherd to rebuke the leaders of South Judah. God used the metaphor of a shepherd to rebuke the leaders of South Judah. God had also used the metaphor of the shepherd and the sheep through Jeremiah as well. Later, Jesus also used the metaphor of the false shepherd. First, a false shepherd fed only himself and did not feed the sheep. Second, he only took the fat and the wool of the sheep rather than looking after them. Third, he did not look after the sick or weak sheep. Fourth, he did not go after the lost sheep. Fifth, he governed over the sheep with spite. Because of such a shepherd, the sheep were consumed and attacked by wild beasts. Fourth point, God declared that the scattered people will be restored through the Messiah. God promised as care the salvation of the flock. God was different to the false shepherds. God was interested in the lost sheep, wished to feed them well, made sure they slept well, and wanted to heal and strengthen the sick and weak sheep. A shepherd to a sheep is a crucial figure. A sheep cannot be fully protected without a shepherd. God used this metaphor to reveal how due to an irresponsible leader. The people had all become scattered and lost. Because the leaders had failed in their responsibilities, God himself declared that he would be the shepherd for the people of South Judah. The bad sheep would be judged. To the good sheep, God promised to send them the Messiah. God had prepared Jesus Christ for the descendants of David. The Messiah would bring peace and blessing. The Messiah would also protect the people. The Messiah would let the people know that God governs over Israel. The news that Jerusalem had fallen was heart-wrenching news for the people of South Judah who were already in Babylon. They felt like they no longer had hope. At this point, God told them that He was their God. Fifth point. To Edom, who helped Babylon strike South Judah, God once again declared judgment. God declared judgment on Edom through Ezekiel. God had spoken of their judgment through Amos and Obadiah. God declared that Edom would perish due to their sins. God outlined all their arrogance and evil doings. Edom could have chosen to act differently after seeing the fall of South Judah and the reason behind their fall. It was a good opportunity for them to turn from their ways and to act differently. God had expected Edom to repent and change. However, Edom rejoiced when South Judah fell and looked only for their profit. Day 254, Ezekiel 36-37 The Vision of the Dry Bone God promised to Israel, who was in despair and lifeless, like dry bones, that He would give them the strength of life and restore them. First point, the reason why North Israel and South Judah fell in the hands of Assyria 
and Babylon respectively was because they did not keep the bilateral covenant with God. God declared judgment on the surrounding countries of North Israel and South Judah, who were pleased when they fell. God revealed that their punishment was not due to Israel's limited abilities, but because of God's anger and jealousy. God continued to speak of South Judah's punishment and their restoration, which was to follow. God spoke of South Judah after the 70 years of captivity and how a kingdom of priests would be restored. This was recorded in Jeremiah. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. Next, we come to the records of Ezra. Now, these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captivity to Babylon, they returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to their own town, in company with Jerubbabel, Joshua, Nehemiah, Sereah, Lilaya, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpah, Phi, Lehum, and Bana. God then included the reason for North Israel and South Judah's punishment. God clearly declared that the reason for their fall was because they did not keep their side of the bilateral covenant. Second point, God hoped for the day Israel would be restored to him. God told Ezekiel about his new covenant. God put this into context with the laws of a kingdom of priests. The reason Israel was able to be restored was not because of their righteousness, but because of God's holy name. Israel sinned against God, and they did not have anything they could use to make themselves righteous. However, God had given them His holy name and put out His hand to restore them. As such, God forgives the people with His love and mercy. Israel would be purified, live in abundance, and live away from evil after their repentance. Third point. Just as God breathed life into Adam's nose, God was to breathe life into the dry bones and make them into an army. God showed Ezekiel the vision of the dry bones. God showed how he breathed life into the dry bones. God told Ezekiel to command the dry bones, and it suddenly came to life and formed an army. The dry bones symbolized Israel, and God's breath of life showed how God wished to save them. This was like when God breathed life into the first man Adam. Likewise, he wished to breathe life into Israel. The dry bones reported to here were the captives of South Judah who were taken to Babylon. God said that they would be able to come out from their tombs and return to Jerusalem. At the time, the people of South Judah in Babylon lost hope after hearing about the fall of Jerusalem. They no longer had a home to return to. The people who lost all hope were like the dry bones, Ezekiel saw during his vision. Ezekiel was able to see new hope amidst despair. Fourth point, God used the metaphor of the two sticks to symbolize the restoration of the kingdom of priests and the kingdom of God for the people of South Judah after they returned from Babylon captivity. God showed Ezekiel two sticks as a metaphor. God moreover interpreted what they meant. This showed how South Judah and North Israel would come together again as the twelve tribes of Israel and those who were taken to Assyria and Babylon would all be able to come back to the land of Israel to be restored as holy citizens in a kingdom of priests. This was God giving them the big picture of the coming of the Messiah. Fifth point, God joined his grace covenant with the new covenant to Ezekiel. Among the 66 books in the Bible, 
The special point about Ezekiel is that it records numerous symbols representing the covenant. First is the Christ covenant. The second is the prophecy of the new covenant. The third is the restored covenant. In Ezekiel, we come across God's covenant of how our bodies will be the holy temple. Ezekiel persuaded the captives to accept these messages of God. Day 255, Ezekiel 38-39 Seven years worth of logs used as spoils. God showed Israel who lived in a foreign country a prophecy of the picture of Gog being destroyed. First point, among the visions God showed at Kiel, one was Gog's soldiers attacking Israel. We are not entirely sure where Magog was or who exactly Gog was. But in the vision God showed to Ezekiel, Gog appears with his soldiers to attack Jerusalem. In the vision, Gog tried to attack Israel, which had become one nation. They were to invade a land of unwalled village and attack peaceful and unsuspecting people. This was a warning that Israel would have to return to a place with no words or safety precautions. But they did not have to worry as God was to protect them from all harm and danger. Despite how God told Israel to rely on him through numerous prophets, Israel had failed to do so, which meant that God used Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, and other empires to teach them. God hoped for the day of their restoration and so told Ezekiel to persuade the people. Second point, God brought down all sorts of plagues and declared that he would fight against Gogol's soldiers. The reason Gogol's soldiers attacked Israel was because of their greed. Gogol furthermore desired to take from Sheba, Didan, and Tashishi. However, Gogol's attack on South Judah was a part of God's plan in order to reveal God's holiness to the whole world. Israel was slowly building up hope. Towards the day, they would be able to restore the temple. God therefore made his plans for them. God's plan involved the people returning to Jerusalem and living peacefully amidst their restored temple. God planned for the rising power of Gog to strike Israel and then for God to save them and perish Gog. This was ultimately in order to reveal his glory to the world. This plan also revealed God's great love for Israel. God was to judge Gog in the days to come. God declared that he would bring down all sorts of plagues in order to fight against Gog for Israel. God would bring an earthquake which will make all the fish in the sea, birds in the sky and animals on land shiver with fear. All the mountains and walls would fall down. The men would stab their own brothers with swords. Diseases will spread and hail would fall down. As such, God would reveal his greatness through such measures. Third point. After God's judgment on Gog, God declared that Israel would be able to earn their firewood for seven years. God went on to proclaim judgment on Gog. God's plan was indeed astonishing. To the people of South Judah who were living as captives in Babylon, God made plans beyond their imaginations. Through the vision God showed to Ezekiel of Gog falling, God ultimately revealed how he was planning their restoration. God planned for the spoils from Gog to be so substantial that Israel would not have to work for seven years. All of the spoils that Gog accumulated over the years would become Israel's. Fourth point, by judging the Gog soldiers, God would receive his honor. God showed at Kiel the vision of Gog perishing in detail and hoped for the restoration of Israel through it. Gog's forces were to completely go down. 
through the judgment of Gog, God was to show the people of Israel that He was their God. Moreover, the people were to realize why North Israel fell in the hands of Assyria and why South Judah fell in the hands of Babylon and why the people had to be taken as captives. Fifth point, Israel would be restored as a holy citizens in the kingdom of priests. God spoke of Israel's restoration. Their restoration would begin with the return of the captives from Babylon after 70 years. They would be restored as Abraham's descendants and the holy citizens of a kingdom of priests. Day 256, Ezekiel 42-41 Ezekiel's sketch of the new temple through the vision of the temple being rebuilt, the people of Israel came to realize the wonderful plan that God had in order to restore them. First point, the vision of the new Jerusalem temple, which God showed Ezekiel, was the conclusion to Ezekiel's records and ultimately the height of Israel's restoration. When the people of South Judah who were already in Babylon as captives heard the news that Jerusalem had completely collapsed, they gave up hope of ever returning. However, thankfully, they learned that they would be able to return after 70 years and that the time in Babylon symbolized punishment, education, Sabbath, and the lifespan of the Babylonian Empire. Thus, Unlike other captives from other countries who gave up on their national identities, the people of South Judah, who were called the Jews by the Babylonians, lived with hope and improved themselves there. There was, however, one thing that pained them. They knew that they had to stay in Babylon for 70 years, and that in 70 years, the Babylonian Empire would come to an end. But their temple had burned down, and God's dwelling place no longer existed. To be frank, before the temple had burned down, it was not as if they had used it well or kept the annual festivals of the kingdom of priests. That was the ultimate reason as to why they were taken to Babylon as captives in the first place. But now they sincerely missed the Jerusalem temple. They were no longer able to keep the annual festivals even if they wanted to. They were forced into doing labor, commanded by the Babylonian Empire. Only at this point did the people wish to keep the annual festivals of the Kingdom of Priests, and only at this point did the people realize that the festivals were a gift given to them by God. They also came to realize how blessed it was to be able to go to God's temple and make their offerings. When the people started to miss the temple during the 10th fifth year, since the second group of captives had been taken to Babylon, so the 14th year since the burning down of the Jerusalem temple, God showed Ezekiel the vision of the reconstructed temple and thus gave the people hope. Second point, God showed Ezekiel the exact logistics behind the new Jerusalem temple and told Ezekiel to tell this to the South Judah captives who were in Babylon. God showed Ezekiel the vision of the restored Jerusalem temple. In God's vision, Ezekiel saw a man whose appearance was like bronze, standing in the gateway with a linen coat and the measuring rod in his hand. God told Ezekiel to pay attention to everything that he was shown and to repeat everything that he saw. During that time, the people of South Judah were far from their homeland and living a hard life in Babylon as captives. Hence, God showed them through Ezekiel how they would indeed be restored and how Jerusalem would relive its glory days. This was God's great love for them. Third point, Ezekiel, who was well-educated and skilled as a priest and prophet, 
was told by God to sketch out the restored Jerusalem temple. God first showed Ezekiel the vision of the outside of the new Jerusalem temple. The vision was as follows. Ezekiel was shown a wall completely surrounding the temple area with the length of the measuring rod in the man's hands that was six cubits long. Then Ezekiel was taken to the east gate where he was to climb his steps and measure the threshold of the gate, which was one rod deep. Through this east gate, God's glory shone through. Next day, Ezekiel was shown the outer court, followed by the north gate, then the south gate. God then showed Ezekiel the three gates to the inner court. The annexed buildings included rooms for preparing sacrifices and rooms for the priestess. God showed Ezekiel the details within the temple, including all the rooms and their purposes. As such, God showed Ezekiel the outer area of the temple first, including all its doors and gates, and then moved on to the inner areas. God also showed the separate room of the priestess, as the priestess were mediators between God and the people. They were given a special area whereby they could prepare and last. This was God showing the people that he would meet with them. Lastly, God showed the portico of the temple. First point, the new sketch of the Jerusalem temple symbolized the coming of Jesus Christ. God continued to show Ezekiel the vision of the main hall, holy place, and the most holy place. Ezekiel was taken by God's angel to the holy place and then into the most holy place alone. This was because the most holy place was only permitted for the high priest. The design of the temple shown by God symbolized the temple of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The missing items in the temple God showed to Ezekiel was firstly the curtain, and this was because the curtain was to be ripped in half by Jesus. The second was the bread, as Jesus was to become the bread of life. The third was the light stand, as Jesus is the light of the world. The fourth was the ark, as Jesus completed the covenant. As such, Ezekiel was shown around the new temple guided by God's angel. The holy place and the most holy place were a symbol of God's love and forgiveness. Although the people disobeyed God and worshipped idols, God nevertheless promised to forgive and to restore them. Fifth point, Ezekiel's sketch of the new temple became the most valuable and important record for the returned captives. God showed Ezekiel the walls of the temple. The measurements were to be six cubits thick and each side of the room around the temple was to be four cubits wide. The side rooms were on three levels, one above the other with 30 on each level. God continued to show Ezekiel the vision of the buildings facing the temple courtyard. Ezekiel recorded his visions in detail. The records of Ezekiel were used after the fall of Babylon and when the people were able to return to Jerusalem. Ezekiel carefully recorded the height and width of even the wooden altars. But something we can learn is that the new design of the altars was comparably bigger than the design God originally gave in Exodus chapters 25 and 37. Day 257 Ezekiel 42-43 God enters through the east gate. The pattern of the new temple and the system of sacrifice contained the strong will of God who said that he would set up Israel again as a kingdom of a priestess. First point, God gave Moses the plans for the tabernacle in the desert and as Kiel, the plans for the restored Jerusalem temple in Babylon. God, who gave Moses the design of the ark 
now gave Ezekiel in Babylon the vision of the restored Jerusalem temple. God showed the rooms of the priestess through his angel. This holy room was described in Ezekiel chapter 40. There was a dedicated room for the priestess to protect the altars, and also a separate room for the priestess who took care of the temple. Among these rooms, God showed Ezekiel the two rooms on the north side. God then showed the two rooms on the south side. God also outlined the tasks for the priestess who were to reside in these dedicated rooms. The priestess were therefore expected to serve God all the more. Second point, God gave Ezekiel the vision of the restored Jerusalem temple with all the details. Next, God showed Ezekiel the areas around the outer area. The newly restored Jerusalem temple was 500 cubits long and 500 cubits wide to separate the holy from the common. Third point, Ezekiel, during God's vision, saw the glory of God, leave the Jerusalem temple, and then return again. In one of his previous visions, Ezekiel saw God's glory leave the Jerusalem temple. The holy place, the tabernacle, was for the Israel nation, and it was where God's presence dwelt. As such, God wanted to meet with his people in the holy place. But for the first 70 years, God's presence had left them. However, although God's presence no longer rested in Jerusalem, God dwelled among the people in Babylon. But through Ezekiel, God showed that he would once again be present in the newly restored temple. As God dwelled with Moses, David, and Solomon, he promised to dwell again with the people in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was able to see this through God's vision. God declared that he would once again be with the people in the temple. Later on, St. John saw Jesus during a vision. Fourth point, God told Ezekiel to tell the people of South Judah that if they no longer worship the idols, then he would dwell with them always. God promised Ezekiel that he would once again dwell among the Israelites. God declared that in the newly restored temple, where the people no longer worshipped idols, he would dwell forever. As such, God outlined how he would restore Israel. In other words, Israel would be restored from their idol worship and their lies. God moreover declared that he would restore his relationship with the people as well as his laws. God wanted the people who were currently in Babylon as captives to live sincerely before God, as he would in time restore them. Fifth point, God told Ezekiel to show the plans of the restored Jerusalem temple to the people of South Judah and furthermore to be ashamed of their sins. God gave Ezekiel the vision and design of the new Jerusalem temple and then told him to tell the people of South Judah to repent. This was with the intention to make the people have the heart to restudy the laws and content of a kingdom of priests and for them to ultimately restore themselves as a holy people. God then gave the laws to the people with the vision of their new temple. This was like the new covenant God gave to Jeremiah. Ezekiel chapters 44 to 46 detailed the information concerning offerings to God in the new temple. The first part explained the altar for the offering. In order to make an offering to God, a priest, the offering person, and the offering was required. God gave details regarding the shape and size of the altar. God also gave further details regarding how to make the offering. But the most surprising thing is that despite giving all these procedures, Jesus later came and sacrificed his own blood for our sins 
to make it a one-way system to salvation. Day 258, Ezekiel 44-46, a temple full of God's glory. God who presented his expectant plan, dreaming of a new Israel, also clarified the missions of those who held critical positions. First point, God once again gave the responsibility of serving in the temple to the descendants of Levi for the future restoration of his glory. God told Ezekiel to ensure that the outer gate of the sanctuary would remain shut. This symbolized how, by closing the east gate of the temple, God's glory would enter and remain there. In other words, this showed how God's glory would no longer leave the temple. Therefore, the people were not to enter from the same door as the one God entered through. As such, God showed Ezekiel how his glory would be present and full in the new temple. The people of Israel were to listen to God's decrees and laws and to enter the temple. God continued to explain the sanctuary for the foreign nations. This was in order to keep God's glory holy. In order to do so, God restored the Levites as priests. God told the Levites who had sinned that they were no longer permitted to serve as priests, but to the Levites who did not sin, they were to take on the role. Thus, the descendants of Zadok from the Levite tribe were given the role of a priestess. The people mentioned here by God were the Levites who sinned against God by serving idols. These Levites had led the people into sin. Thus, only the descendants of Zadok were able to maintain the role of a priestess. Due to the sins of the priestess, South Judah had fatally collapsed. And now God spoke of the full restoration of the Levites and how he would raise the descendants of Zadok to continue on the mission. Second point, God told Ezekiel to recite God's laws of a kingdom of priests in Babylon, which he gave to Moses on Mount Sinai all those years ago. Through Ezekiel, God spoke of how the priests were to keep the laws. When they entered the gates of the inner court, they were to wear linen. They were not to wear any woolen garment. While ministering at the gates of the inner court or inside the temple, they were not to shave their heads or let their hair grow long. They were to keep their hair of their heads trimmed. The priests were forbidden to drink wine. They were not to marry widows or divorced women. They were to teach God's people the difference between the holy and the common and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and clean. In the case of a dispute, the priests were to serve as judges and decide, according to God's ordinances and also to keep God's Sabbath holy. A priest was also not to defile himself. A priest was to also offer a sin offering. As such, after mentioning the laws for the priest, God promised that he would become their lively food. God told these laws for the priests to Moses after Exodus, and now he told them to Ezekiel for the priests of South Judah. God said this with the hope that they would no longer serve idols or rely on other powers. The priests had a significant role in the fall of South Judah, and thus they were thoroughly warned of how they were to behave from now on. They were to keep the laws and stand righteous before God in order to not repeat what they were going through right now. God declared that he would provide for them on the condition that they obeyed. Third point, the reason God gave kings their designated territories was in order for them to not steal away the land of the people. To look back, God gave the promised land to Abraham, and Abraham's descendants were to live in it. 
and to act as stewards with God as the owner. After Exodus, God distributed the land between the twelve tribes, but to Ezekiel, God explained that there would be a holy land which would not be distributed. This holy land was to be used as God's holy sanctuary. It would also be given to the priests and to the Levites. Moreover, it would be given to the Israel people collectively. It would also be given to the prince. The reason God was to give this land to the prince was as follows. This land will be his possession in Israel. And my princes will no longer oppress my people, but will allow the people of Israel to possess the land according to their tribes. God had in mind how in the past Lehoboam and Jehoiakim took the land from the people. Therefore, God judged the kings. God explained that excluding the Holy Land, the remaining land would be given to the Israelites. God then continued on to give regulations regarding offerings. Fourth point, in Ezekiel chapter 46, we can see how Ezekiel retaught the laws in a kingdom of priests to the people. God explained to Ezekiel of the regulations involved in keeping the annual festivals for the people when they returned to Jerusalem once the 70 years were over. In the first month and the first day, they were to take a young bull without defect and purify the sanctuary. The next involved regulations for Passover. The regulations given to Moses regarding Passover were recorded in Exodus 12, verses 13 to 15. The next detailed the seven days of the festivals. Next, God emphasized the rules regarding Sabbath as well as the day of the new moon. This was the command for the gate of the inner court to be opened on the day of Sabbath and on the day of the new moon. This showed how the regulations for offerings in the new temple were made stricter. This involved the regulations for how and where the people were to enter and leave the temple. Fifth point, God declared that he would happily receive the offerings made with a good heart. Now, God went on to explain the processes for the king and the people of South Judah when they entered the temple and when they made their offerings. Until now, the people had made offerings for the sake of making them. They offered without the faith that God would accept. But God told them that he did not accept offerings that lacked faith or heart. God now told them that he would accept their offering on the condition of their sincere hearts. God would accept their repentance and their willingness. God went on to speak about the inheritance to their sons. God moreover detailed the laws concerning passing the inheritance to others. God then went on to explain to Ezekiel the regulations involved in preparing the offering. Day 259, Ezekiel 47 to 48, the water flowing from the temple. The scenes where compartments of new heaven and new earth were decided by God showed that Israel would be newly resuscitated. First point, the flowing water from the temple which Ezekiel saw during God's vision becomes the backdrop to the water in Revelation which flowed in the new heavens and new earth. God showed Ezekiel a vision of water flowing out of the new Jerusalem temple. The water shone came out from under the threshold of the temple, toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water also came down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. Swarms of living creatures lived wherever the river flowed with large amounts of fish. However, the swamps and marshes were not fresh, but they were left for salt. This meant that this land no longer had use, and this was referring to the words spoken by God through the prophet Zephaniah. 
God continued to speak of the abundance the river would bring. This description provided the base for the descriptions of the new heavens and the new earth recorded in Revelation. Second point, the laws God gave to Moses and Ezekiel regarding land distribution was always according to regulation and always fair. To Ezekiel, God explained of how the land would be distributed to the people once the 70 years in Babylon was over and they would be able to return. The regulations regarding land distribution was very fair and according to the borderlines of the decided territories. As God had promised Abraham, the people of Israel were to inherit and live in this land. This was also God fulfilling his promise with Moses. God continued to provide the logistics for the land for the people of South Judah. When they returned from Babylon captivity, God also remembered the foreigners who lived with the people of South Judah. God once again revealed how he was the God for all nations. Third point, the method of a casting lot was used by Joshua and the method used during the time of Ezekiel was God's guidance and the casting lot. The land distribution in Ezekiel chapter 48 regarding the promised land has its foundation in Joshua's land distribution, which was according to the casting lot method and also according to God's will. The people of Israel would get their land as they did back when they were first given land as the twelve tribes of Israel. All the tribes had equal right, but this time round, the focus was to be around the Jerusalem temple. The first step was for the land north of the temple to be distributed between seven tribes. All the tribes would be given their land from the west to the Jordan. With the Holy Land at the center, seven tribes were to be given land north to the temple, and then the remaining five to be given land south to the temple. The tribes to live in the north were to be Dan, Ashur, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, and Judah. The tribe of Judah in particular was to be given the land closest to the Holy Land. Fourth point, during the days of Joshua, the land distributed was between the east and west of the Jordan. And during the days of Ezekiel, the land distributed was between the north and south as seen from the western side of the Jordan. God explained to Ezekiel how Israel would be restored and the responsibilities and tasks for each tribe. This time round, the land would be distributed centering the Jordan River to the south and north sides, which was different to the days of Joshua, the west and east sides of the Jordan. Although the people of South Judah were still living as captives in Babylon, in time the Jerusalem temple would be restored and so would their society. God's vision would once again come to life. This time, the people were to obey God. South to the temple, the land was to be distributed to the tribes of Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulon, and Gad. Closest to the Holy Land would be the tribe of Judah in the north, and the tribe of Benjamin in the south. God continued to explain the details regarding the Jerusalem gates. Twelve gates were detailed, and each would have the names of each tribe on them. And the name of the city was to be called Jehovah Shammah, meaning the Lord is there. God would dwell among them forever. Fifth point, Ezekiel concluded his book with the words, the Lord is there. The Bible records numerous references to God. The first is the Lord will provide. The second is the Lord will hear. The third is the Lord is my banner. The fourth is the Lord is peace. The fifth is the Lord is our righteousness. 
The sixth is the load is there. In the concluding parts of Ezekiel, God declares that he will be there. Back when Babylon besieged Jerusalem, God proclaimed that he had left them, but now God was to return to them. God showed Ezekiel how he was to restore them and commanded Ezekiel to persuade them. The Lord is there also symbolized how Babylon captivity was not the end for them. God's love is never ending, and that is why we can hope today. Day 260, Daniel 1 to 2. Daniel sketching out the changes of the empires. Through Daniel, who made a firm choice by deciding to do the will of God despite being a captive, God's will was conveyed to those who ruled empires. First point Daniel was the prophet who sketched out the five empires in the Bible Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Hellas, and Rome. Daniel and his three friends were taken to Babylon during the first round in 605 BC. The second round of captives were taken 11 years before the fall of South Judah, and the people taken were King Jehoiachin, Ezekiel, and some 10,000 skilled workers. This showed that God's work did not only occur in the land of Canaan. Now these people were to become good figs in the kingdom of priests. Daniel was especially a brilliant figure who rose to the top of the administrative ladder in both Babylon and Persia. God also gave Daniel visions during his prayers, and he became a man of deep spirituality. When Daniel was born, the empire to hold the most influential power was Assyria. However, the country he was taken to was Babylon. Later on, Babylon fell and he then lived in Persia. In other words, Daniel experienced the changing of empires during his lifetime, and he proclaimed the prophecy about the five empires in the Bible, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Hellas, and Rome. Second point, Nebuchadnezzar's ideological education and Jeremiah's a kingdom of priests education met through Daniel. When the Babylonian empire besieged South Judah, they demanded tribute as well as outstanding young men to be taken as captives to Babylon. And thus, Daniel and his three friends were taken to Babylon. But he allied God's great plan. God had already spoken of this through the prophet Jeremiah. God intended to show Daniel the difference between a kingdom of priests and an empire. The Babylonian empire governed their conquered countries via two tracks. The first was their ideological education, which involved taking 0.1% of the most brilliant young men and educating them in the ways of Babylon. The second track was to send these young men back after their training and then make them govern their people in the Babylonian way. The young men were given the food and education of the Babylonian king. They were also taught the Babylonian language. Another important aspect was learning about the ways of the Babylonian empire. Daniel and his three friends managed to obtain the most prestigious grades. Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon planned to bring in the elite from his conquered countries and then make them implement the Babylonian ways back in their countries. However, God's plan expanded beyond that of Nebuchadnezzar's. God intended to use Nebuchadnezzar's vision to implement and carry out his vision of world management and make the people of Israel into good figs in a kingdom of priests. Third point, Daniel decided to eat according to the laws in a kingdom of priests. Daniel was provided with the king's food and wine. However, the food provided by Babylon did not agree with the food 
listed in Leviticus. Thus, Daniel decided not to eat this food. This was putting his life at risk. When Ashpenaz, the chief of the court officials, heard of Daniel's request to not eat the food, he said no, and his own life was also at risk. Thus, Daniel made a deal with him. The food that Daniel decided to have was according to the list in Leviticus chapter 11. This was a record made 900 years ago by Moses. Daniel decided this in order to prove just how outstanding a kingdom of priests was. Fourth point, the Egyptian pharaoh requested the interpretation of his dream and the Babylonian king requested both the contents and interpretations of his dream. Back in Genesis, the pharaoh wanted Joseph to interpret his dream. But Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon asked his wise men to interpret his dream without telling them the dream itself. And so, when his men heard this, they all laughed at his ridiculousness. Nebuchadnezzar warned that he would not be fooled by them. Nebuchadnezzar fumed in anger and said he would kill all the wise men. Different to the everyday man, Nebuchadnezzar's words were law. His words had the power to kill Zedekiah's two sons and also to gouge out Zedekiah's eyes. Knowing this, Daniel turned to God for help. Thankfully, Daniel had the knowledge of the records in Genesis about Joseph. Daniel knew that it was God who gave wisdom and visions, and he also asked his friends to pray for him. Fifth point, through Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel was able to find out that God governs the whole world and that wisdom and power comes from God alone. God heard the prayers of Daniel and his three friends and granted their requests. Daniel praised God. Daniel's prayer contained the knowledge and faith in the kingdom of priests. In his prayer, he praised God who created the universe and who changes times and seasons. He also praised God who governs history and who deposes kings and raises up others. He also praised God who reveals deep and hidden things. God gave Daniel the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. God furthermore told Daniel the reason for this dream. The first part of Nebuchadnezzar's dream concerned the Babylonian Empire. The second concerned the Persian Empire. The third concerned the Hellenistic Empire. The fourth concerned the Roman Empire. The last concerned the Kingdom of God. Thus, Daniel was able to tell Nebuchadnezzar the contents and interpretations of his dream and Nebuchadnezzar praised God. Day 261, Daniel 3-4, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith. What Daniel and his friends showed in the midst of the extremely critical situation was their true faith in God by committing everything to him. First point, Nebuchadnezzar who praised God, changed his mind, and erected a golden idol through his arrogance. Nebuchadnezzar erected a golden idol and made everyone bow down to it. He firstly commissioned the making. This was the same man who praised God after hearing Daniel's interpretation of his dream. But no longer afterwards, he changed his mind and became arrogant. He erected an idol in gold in the shape of what he saw in his dream. He secondly carried out propaganda with this newly made idol. He gathered all of his officials and carried out his propaganda through this golden idol. He also made a special law which ordered everyone to worship it. He suddenly endeavored to spread to the world how brutal and powerful Babylon was through this idol and through this law. At this time, Daniel's three friends were arrested 
as they rejected this law. Because of this, Nebuchadnezzar gave them another opportunity to bow down to it, but they did not obey. They proclaimed that God would save them in any circumstance, and even if God did not save them, they would still not bow down to any idol. Like this, Daniel's three friends declared their faith in God. Second point. Daniel and his three friends did not follow in the ways of their ancestors in idol worship, but later decided to follow and praise God. Nebuchadnezzar became furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he commanded for them to be put into the burning furnace. This was anger against them for not accepting his absolute power. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times stronger than usual and for them to be thrown in it. The fire was so strong that it also killed the soldiers who were carrying out this task. But of course, God's power was so much stronger than that of Nebuchadnezzar. God granted them a miracle in the burning furnace. And so Nebuchadnezzar was unable to conceal his surprise. To Nebuchadnezzar's shock, there were four, not three men in the furnace, and they were freely walking around in the fire. Seeing this, Nebuchadnezzar could not help but praise God. Nebuchadnezzar called them God's servants, and furthermore commanded that if anyone spoke badly of God, they would be punished. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were then given higher ranking positions there onwards. Third point, Daniel chapter 4 records the contents of Nebuchadnezzar's decree. Nebuchadnezzar spread around his decree throughout all of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had experienced through Daniel and his three friends three miracles. The first was Daniel telling him his dream and then interpreting what it meant. The second was the miracle of the burning furnace. The third was Daniel interpreting his second dream. The time Nebuchadnezzar had his second dream was around the time Babylon was at peace. It was here that God warned him that this peace would not be for long. Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel to interpret this dream. The contents of Nebuchadnezzar's second dream and Daniel's interpretation were the following. The first was that the central tree was growing at a great speed and that its fruits were so abundant that all people could eat from it. This symbolized how Babylon was to rule the world and how influential it had become. Then a messenger from heaven came down to cut the tree, but to leave the stump. This symbolized how Nebuchadnezzar would suddenly lose his power, and how Nebuchadnezzar would live among wild animals and eat grass. Lastly, a warning against Nebuchadnezzar was made. Hearing this, Nebuchadnezzar knew that this was God's punishment on him. Fourth point. Although Nebuchadnezzar understood in his head Daniel's warnings, he did not take it into his heart. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he saw that his power had reached the heavens, but that he would be cut down. However, if he accepted that God was the ruler over the world, then he would be able to stand again. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar to repent of his sins and to be merciful to the poor. This was largely a message to accept that God is the ruler of the world. Daniel warned him that he would be at peace the sooner he realized and accepted this. Unfortunately, even after a year since hearing this warning, Nebuchadnezzar did not listen to Daniel's advice. He missed his opportunity to repent, and thus he was to be punished by God. Nebuchadnezzar was punished as soon as God's voice was heard. He was to temporarily live among the wild beasts rather than humans. Fifth point, the last records of Nebuchadnezzar's decree 
or that he praised God in heaven after his punishment. Nebuchadnezzar was able to know who God was after his punishment, and thus he praised God. He finally realized that God ruled over the world. At last, Nebuchadnezzar did not rely on his own power, but on God's power and confessed this. As such, Daniel put his life on the line in order for Nebuchadnezzar to realize and confess this. A. 262 Daniel 5-6 The prayer for Jerusalem for 70 years. In the flow of the ages, when the empire was transferred from Babylon to Persia, Daniel revealed God's power with balanced spirituality and sociality. First point, the last night of the Babylonian empire was recorded in detail by Daniel. Despite knowing that the Persian soldiers were attacking Babylon, the Babylonian king was enjoying a feast inside with a faith that everything would be all right. That night, a thousand of the nobles and the high-ranking officials were invited to the feast, and the cups and the plates used for the entertainment were the articles from the Temple of Jerusalem. To look at the circumstances of Babylon at the time, King Belshazzar's father left the country to his son, and he himself went to the desert for ten years in order to worship an idol called Sin. So Belshazzar took power, and the night before the fall of Babylon, he invited a thousand nobles and officials to feast and to drink. The articles in the Jerusalem temple were taken during the days of Jehoiachin, as the objects in the temple were being used for drinking and entertainment. Suddenly, a hand materialized and the writing on the wall appeared. All the people who were present turned pale, and Belshazzar was unable to think clearly as he shook in fear. His fear was so great, making him declare that anyone who was able to interpret what was written on the wall would be given the third highest position in the country, with his father in first place, himself in second, and the person to interpret this coming next. Second point, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar the meaning of the golden idol and Belshazzar the meaning of the writing on the wall. When chaos broke out in the feast, the queen or the king's mother recommended the king to go seek Daniel for help. Therefore, on the queen's recommendation, Daniel was brought over during the night and was told to interpret the writing. Daniel explained that the writing was the same as when Nebuchadnezzar had lost power. And as Belshazzar, who knew this, was still arrogant, God's punishment was now to be upon them. Daniel once again reminded the king of Nebuchadnezzar's decree, which stated that no one was permitted to speak against the Lord. The decree mentioned here by Daniel was in reference to Nebuchadnezzar's second decree. And now Daniel started to interpret what was written on the wall. Many meant that God had numbered the days of the king's reign and brought it to an end. Tekel meant the king had been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Perez meant his kingdom would be divided and given to the Medes and Persians. All in all, the writing on the wall stated that God had decided that Babylon would come to an end and that God would now divide the power into two. Although what Daniel said was absolutely shocking to say the least. Belshazzar thanked Daniel for the interpretation and indeed made Daniel the third in power. And so, for the remaining few hours of the Babylonian Empire, Daniel was made the third in power. Daniel's prophecy came true in a matter of hours. Third point, although the politicians of the Persian Empire did all their research to find a fault in Daniel, they were unable to find even a small one. Now Babylon fell and the Persian Empire rose. Daniel was scouted 
to an even higher position in the Persian Empire. But the politicians who worked for King Darius were jealous of Daniel. And this was because Darius tried to make Daniel lord over them. In order to find a fault in Daniel, they started to trace back Daniel's records. They looked into his life, including his faith, his personal life, and his professional life. But they could not find a single fault. Despite how Daniel worked for both the Babylonian and the Persian empires, he was totally clean from any faults. In the end, they made a fault of his religion. The fact that they made the law valid for only 30 days shows that this law was directly targeted at Daniel. The man who made this law also knew how powerful the king's decree was. First point, despite knowing the trap targeted at him, Daniel still fried throughout the Babylonian and Persian empires. Daniel did not last in prayer all throughout the Babylonian and Persian empires. The reason Daniel was able to live in faith was thanks to Jeremiah's letter. Daniel knew that the Babylonian Empire would expire after 70 years, and he also knew that a kingdom of priests was incomparably stronger than any empire. Thus, Daniel did not kneel before Babylon or Persia. The prayer of Daniel was based on Solomon's dedication of the temple. In Babylon, Daniel had lived with the best clothes, best food, and best accommodation. In many ways, he lived a better life than he would have lived if he was in Jerusalem. But despite this, he prayed ever so sincerely for the restoration of the Jerusalem temple. Even when his life was in danger, he still prayed for his people and for the temple. Fifth point. Darius came to trust Daniel all the more after the instant of the lion's den. When the Persian officials saw that Daniel did not last to pray, they skimmed through this. But they came to find that the Persian king worried for Daniel. Eventually, Daniel was placed into the lion's den. When Daniel was placed into the den, Darius fasted and even went to check on Daniel at dawn. On the night, Daniel went into the lion's den. The Persian officials would have had the most pleasant sleep. However, Darius became so angry that he had been fooled and so went to the den first thing in the morning. When he called out for Daniel, to his surprise, Daniel answered back, Daniel was alive. This was God's miracle. The Persian officials who skimmed against Daniel had quite the end. Darius furthermore sent out a decree. The remaining days of Daniel's life was peaceful. Day 263, Daniel 7-9 Vision of four animals and the king's files. God showed Daniel, through dreams and visions, the event of the future of the countries and the empires. First point, God showed Daniel visions and by doing so, showed that God was the ruler of the world. Daniel was shown four visions and they were of the four beasts, ram and a goat, Daniel's prayer and the 77th, and then chapter 10 to 12 showed a vision of the great battle. The first vision that he saw was of the four beasts, and they symbolized the four empires that remained, which were Babylon, Persia, Hellas, and Rome. The first beast out of the four represented the Babylonian Empire. The empire to knock down Babylon was Persia. The third beast represented the Hellenistic Empire. The fourth beast, Daniel saw, represented the Roman Empire. Through this, he was able to learn that God governed the whole world and its history. When God first showed him the vision, he struggled to understand what they meant. When Daniel asked God 
what they meant. God showed him more visions. God showed him the image of God making judgment and how there was a book right next to it. God continued to show the vision of the Son of Man. Eventually, Daniel was able to see the vision of the Messiah. God showed Daniel that empires were finite, but the kingdom of God was infinite. Thus, Daniel became God's prophet. The visions God showed to Daniel consoled the people of South Judah and also gave them hope for the future. Second point, after learning about God's vision of the four beasts, Daniel engraved this message close to his heart. God provided Daniel with the explanation regarding the vision of the four beasts. Each beast represented an empire and all these empires were to be judged by God. They would all fall, but God's kingdom would remain forever. The four empires would attack and rule of the people, whereas God's kingdom would be given to those who believed. The beasts would persecute the holy people, and then the fourth beast kingdom would trample over the last. However, God, the righteous judge, will bring his everlasting kingdom. God's kingdom would rise to last forever. Third point. Just as Ezekiel was in Jerusalem through God's vision, Daniel was also near the Rai River through God's vision. Now we come to the vision of the lamb and the goat. The second vision given to him in chapter 8. This vision came to Daniel two years after seeing the first vision of the four beasts. Just as Ezekiel was given a vision of Jerusalem, Daniel was also given a vision of the Ulai River. In this vision, Daniel saw a ram. The ram with the two horns symbolized Bid and Persia, which represented the Persian Empire. The second vision was of the goat. The male goat symbolized the Hellenistic Empire. During the second vision, Daniel was accompanied by the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel also appears later on to tell of the birth of John the Baptist. The angel Gabriel also told of the birth of Jesus. Daniel was shown the vision of the Messiah, and he knelt down in fear and then fell asleep. In other words, he passed out. When he woke up, he went about his administrative tasks. Daniel was a politician and an administrator. More importantly, he was a man of God who experienced God's spirituality and also delivered God's message and will. Fourth point, Daniel realized that the 70 years of Babylon had almost come to an end through Jeremiah's letter and started to fast and pray for his people and his country. In the first year of Darius, Daniel understood from the scriptures that the 70 years of Babylon captivity had come to an end. Daniel knew that it was not long before the people would be able to return to Jerusalem. Thus, he recorded this in his book. This was less than a year before the people were able to return to Jerusalem. Daniel did not merely see God's visions and record them down. We can understand this through his prayer. Daniel was someone who saw and felt the reality for the people of South Judah, just like how Nehemiah fasted and prayed for his people. Daniel also fasted and prayed for his people. Daniel confessed that South Judah only had a God to turn to. Daniel replied to Jeremiah's records and prayed for the future of his people and country whilst fasting. Indeed, through Jeremiah's letter, Daniel was able to learn that the 70 years was almost up. In Daniel's prayer, we can see that he was educated in the Pentateuch. Daniel confessed their sins and asked God for forgiveness. He understood the content written in Leviticus chapter 26. And the wider people were given the third stage of punishment. Daniel prayed to God who led the people out of Egypt. 
He prayed that God would also deliver the people out from Babylon. Daniel, moreover, prayed for God's glory and salvation. As such, Daniel prayed for God's mercy and grace. He prayed to God to take away his anger against Jerusalem. Fifth point, as Daniel prayed for his country and his people, the angel Gabriel came and answered his prayer. During the time Daniel prayed for his people and country whilst fasting, the angel Gabriel appeared before him. God had already given Daniel the 77th vision as an answer to his prayer. The angel Gabriel came and explained what this meant. The angel explained when the kingdom of God would be fulfilled. More specifically, this would be after Jesus' cross, when the Roman Empire would destroy the Jerusalem temple completely, and then through to Revelation. This showed that God decided what was to happen in his decided time. Day 264, Daniel 10 to 12. The reason the administrator Daniel was a prophet, knowing and believing that God will intervene in the middle of a rapidly changing world, gives us the will to overcome all hardship and suffering. First point. During the time Daniel fasted in the Tigris River, he came across four visions. Daniel fasted whilst he prayed to God. Now God showed him his final vision. The time of this vision was according to Cyrus's decree. When the first group of captives was able to return to Jerusalem, Daniel also prayed during the time of Passover. Daniel was in great distress, and although the captives were able to return to Jerusalem, things were not going smoothly, and it appeared that war was upon them. Second point, Daniel saw the Messiah during his vision and then fainted with fear and shock. The fourth vision that showed to Daniel was of a man. This man that he saw was the Messiah. The Messiah wore linen with a belt of fine gold from Ufaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of a burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. This was also the image that Jesus' disciples saw in the mountains. St. John also saw Jesus in the island of Patmos. When Daniel saw the Messiah, he was so surprised that he fainted. Only Daniel was able to see this vision of Jesus at this time. Daniel, Jesus' disciples, and St. John all had the same reaction when they came across the vision of Jesus. When Daniel passed out from seeing Jesus' vision, the angel Gabriel came to help him. The reason God showed Daniel this vision was in order for him to start praying for his people and his country. The angel Gabriel explained why he had come, which was to warn of what was to happen to the people. The angel Gabriel, moreover, provided details on the fall of the Persian Empire, as well as the rise of the Hellenistic Empire. Daniel recorded all of this in his book. Third point, Daniel recorded the fall of the Persian Empire and the Hellas Empire, shown by God during his vision. In Daniel chapters 10 and 11, details of the Persian, Hellenistic, and the Egyptian and Syrian Hellenistic Empires are recorded. Although the Persian Empire became strong enough to conquer Babylon and Greece, they were unable to attack Alexander in Macedonia, who was gradually building up the Hellenistic Empire. However, after the death of Alexander, the Hellenistic Empire becomes divided into four, and each form their own monarchy. Such contents were recorded in Daniel chapter 11. The angel Gabriel revealed to Daniel that he would have Darius of Mid. The angel Gabriel also warned of the fall of the Persian Empire and rise of the Hellenistic Empire. 
following on Alexander from Macedonia appeared and formed an expanding empire, but this also did not last long, and the country became divided into four. Fourth point, Daniel also recorded the war between the Ptolemy dynasty and the Seleucus dynasty with the Jews in between. The new Hellenistic empire emerged with the death of Alexander, and this complicated all the administrative and the logistical structure of the empire. The new Egyptian Ptolemy dynasty and the Syrian Seleucus dynasty were formed, and things started to get more complex. The two countries eventually fought with the Jews in between. The Ptolemy dynasty won the first land and ruled Judah for 122 years in peace. This was the when the Pentateuch was translated. Then the Seleucus dynasty took over and ruled over the Jews. Their rule started in peace but ended in much blood and eventually came to an end due to the Jewish Maccabean revolt. Fifth point, Daniel, who was an administrator and a politician, saw God's plan and recorded himself first and foremost as God's prophet whilst hoping for the kingdom of God. In chapter 12, Daniel made a prophecy about the end of the world. This stemmed from Jesus' return. God gave Daniel the following warning. A new Daniel roll up and seal the waters of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. With the coming of the end, the waters of the Bible will come true, and the knowledge will be revealed. Next was recorded the conversation between the angels. Daniel questioned these angels. My Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? Regarding the end of the world, St. Paul also had discussed with the people of Thessalonica church how they were to have patience and to have hope. Having seen and recorded the blueprint of the change of empires, Daniel, who was a politician and an administrator, was first and foremost recorded as God's prophet. Day 265 Ezra 1 to 2, investing 5,400 temple artifacts and the reconstruction generation. The people who decided to return to Jerusalem from Persia took on the mission of rebuilding the temple and returned with high hopes. First point. King Cyrus of Persia decided to manage the Persian Empire through regional decentralization. Babylon, which conquered Assyria and lost to ultimate power, fell. Once the seventh years came to an end, as proclaimed by the prophet Jeremiah. Next to rise was Persia. King Cyrus of Persia set out the policy of regional decentralization and he found fault with the previous policy of centralization during Babylon's rule. All the skilled and intelligent people were gathered in the center of Babylon, and the regional areas were left underdeveloped, which in turn meant that they produced very little tax. An example was Jerusalem. Thus, Cyrus focused his policy on regional decentralization. In order to implement this, Persia allowed the return of the captives to their respective countries and permitted them to have freedom in religion, but no other political activities. Because of this, although South Judah and Babylon were strictly conquered and conqueror, the relationship between South Judah and Persia changed to one of economic alliance. Cyrus sent back the captives to Jerusalem and in order to help them financially, he permitted the reconstruction of the Jerusalem temple. He furthermore returned all the articles taken from the Jerusalem temple by Babylon. A second point, Cyrus's decree is recorded in both two chronicles and Ezra. Ezra started his book by referencing Cyrus's decree. 
Cyrus is decree is documented in both two chronicles and Ezra. When the people of South Judah were taken as captives to Babylon, it was like a dead end to them. However, God gifted them with the record of their history to provide them with a new hope. And when the time came, God made Cyrus of Persia write a decree to send the Israelites back to Jerusalem. Moreover, Cyrus permitted the reconstruction of the Jerusalem temple. Cyrus promised to provide the materials needed for the temple reconstruction. God's plan unraveled in the most unthinkable way for the people of South Judah. What Cyrus was after was for South Judah and for the other captives to return to their countries and to economically prosper so that tax could be paid to the Persian Empire. This was the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy about the 70 years and also the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy about the restoration of the Jerusalem Temple. Third point, the 5,000 and 400 objects in the Jerusalem Temple, which Nebuchadnezzar took during his three attacks, were returned to Jerusalem by the Persian Empire. The people of South Judah were taken to Babylon in three stages under Nebuchadnezzar, and their return also took place in three stages under the Persian Empire. The reason some people chose to remain in Persia during the first stage of return was because the Persians did not force the people to leave. If the Persians had forced the people to leave all at once, then the story of the Purim festival would not have existed. During the first return, the tribe of Benjamin and Judah and some members from the tribe of Levi were the first to return. The return of the captives can be seen as a form of exodus for the people of South Judah. Fourth point, the leaders for the first group of captives back to Jerusalem were Jerubabel, Priest Joshua, and 11 others. During the first return of the captives, God raised the Jerubabel and the Priest Joshua in order to re-establish the system of a kingdom of priests. Governor Jerubabel led the first group along with the high priest Joshua. Haggai and Zechariah and they all worked hard to collectively restore the temple. Thus, the temple restored during this time was referred to as the Jerubabel Temple. Jerubabel was also listed in the family tree of Jesus Christ. Fifth point, 49,897 good figs of a kingdom of priests returned to Jerusalem during the first round. Ezra recorded the returned captives according to their families. The number of priests was 4,289 out of 43,360. But compared to the priests, the Levites were only 341 in number. This was unfortunately because many Levites gave up their positions during captivity. Although they had worked hard during the line of Hezekiah, we can see that their number decreased substantially. Once the first group returned, they worked hard to do the tasks for the temple. Day 266, Edra 3 to 4. The sound of song and the sound of lament. The temple of God, which was miserably broken down by the Babylonian army 70 years ago, finally began construction and its foundation was laid. First point The temple reconstruction generation returned to Jerusalem from Persia and the first thing they did was to restore a kingdom of priests. The people of South Judah who returned to Jerusalem from Babylon after 70 years each lived in their own places and then gathered during the seven months. These people can be called the return captives and also the temple reconstruction generation. 
they worked hard to reconstruct the temple, which had been burned down, and more importantly, to restore the kingdom of priests. One of the first things they did was to make the altar for the offering. Although in reality, they did not even have the grounds prepared for the temple, they still desired to make offerings to God. They did not have the holy place or the most holy place set up, but they made the arrangements to make offerings to God nonetheless. Second point. The temple reconstruction generation went ahead and reconstructed the temple, which had been burned down and non-existent for the past 50 years. Finally, the people started to prepare for the restoration of the temple. They started to recruit skilled workers and the materials needed. The overseeing of the temple reconstruction was carried out by the Levites who were 20 years or older, and the overseers for the workers was Joshua and his team. This was because the Levites knew the most about the temple and its logistics. Third point, both the sound of singing and the lamenting was heard during the process of reconstructing the temple. At last, the temple reconstruction project launched. Although the preparations were not really enough compared to David's preparation, back during his day, the procedures commenced nonetheless. Many people remembered what it was like back then and shed many tears. Both the sound of joy and lamenting could be heard. Both sounds were so loud that it was difficult to differentiate which sound was which. They looked back at the lavish days of Solomon and then the divide of the countries, which was followed by Israel's collapse, captivity, and then returned to Jerusalem. They were indeed grateful to God for enabling them to return and for His grace and mercy. Fourth point, the temple reconstruction generation refused the request of the Samaritans in their help with the temple restoration. When the project for the restoration officially began, the Samaritans asked if they could contribute. The Samaritans became a mixed race nation due to the policy of the Assyrian Empire, and they were believers of all sorts of idols. But they suddenly said they wished to contribute. However, they did not have good motivations in the slightest, and thus their offer was declined. They used the Cyrus's decree as an excuse to say no. Fifth point, the Samaritans continuously interrupted the temple reconstruction project through bribery and false reports. When the returned captives declined their offer, the Samaritans started to bribe the Persian officials to stop the temple reconstruction from occurring. They went out of their way to interrupt this project. Ezra recorded the stop of the project due to the interruption of the Samaritans. Concerning this, Haggai and Zechariah encouraged the returned captives to strengthen their faith in God and to continue on with the restoration project. Because of their interruption, the temple restoration was on hold for 16 years, and it resumed and the second year of Darius's reign. However, judging from the records of Haggai, it appears that the Samaritans were not the only reason this project was delayed. The people of South Judah did not try to overcome this, but reluctantly accepted this situation. The Samaritans went as far as to report them. The first report was made to King Jaxis. The second report was to King Arthur Jaxis. The Samaritans first claimed that the people of South Judah were building evil buildings. The second was that they would restore the temple, but they would not offer tax or tribute to Persia. The third was that they would not be of any help to Persia. The fourth was that they would revolt against Persia. Day 267. 
Hagai wanted. Hagai, remember your priorities. Although the temple reconstruction project was faced with difficulties, the people who heard Hagai pulled themselves together to start again. First point. On the 16th year, the temple reconstruction project had been on hold. God called the prophet Haggai. Prophet Haggai declared that although the Jerusalem temple was in ruins now, it would be recovered with God's glory in the days to come. In the book of Haggai, four of God's messages can be read. The first message came to him in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month. The second came to him in the second year of King Darius, on the twenty-first day of the seventh month. The third message came to him in the second year of King Darius, on the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month. The fourth came to him on the same day as the third message. God's message contained a rebuke to the people for putting on hold the restoration of the temple. At the time, it had been 16 years since the temple restoration had been on hold. Haggai therefore told the people that the temple should have been restored a long time ago. Haggai asked how the people were able to enjoy living in their houses, despite the temple not being restored for the past 16 years. Second point, the temple reconstruction generation heard the rebuke of the prophet Haggai and restarted the temple restoration project. When the people heard Haggai's rebuke, they repented and was encouraged. When Haggai told the people God's message, the people listened. And now, God's history unraveled. The biggest change to happen was that they had the heart to listen to God. In other words, they were prepared to obey God. God told them that He would be with them. The people went hard at work to restore the temple again. Third point, the second message Haggai gave was to make oneself determined. During the second year of King Darius, the second message of God came to Haggai. This came approximately a month since restarting the temple restoration project. The reason for God's message was to console the people, as they had found out that this temple was to be smaller in scale compared to the original temple and thus were disappointed. To the people who had in mind the lavish temple built during the days of Solomon, God told them, to be strong and determined. God said this three times and gave them courage. Jerusalem at the time was indeed still a pitiful sight. It had become so desolate that the old people who remembered the glorious days lamented loudly. This of course made it all the more difficult for Jerubabel and the high priest Joshua. Therefore God gave them courage that he would be with them. Fourth point, the third message Haggai delivered was for the people to remember what it was like when they had been forced to stop building the temple and to be glad of their resumed work. Now God gave the third message to Haggai to deliver to the people of South Judah. This message came two months after giving his second message. This was to tell the people to look back on their actions and to obey God to receive His blessing. God also reminded them how they had stopped the temple reconstruction project. God furthermore reminded them of the plagues that they experienced because of it. Fifth point, the fourth message Haggai delivered was in line with Jeroboam's prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Now God gave Haggai the final message for the people. This last message was given on the same day as the third message. God told him about God's judgment, rule and salvation that was spoken through Jerubbabel as well as the coming of the Messiah. 
Day 268, Zechariah 1 to 6. Only through the Holy Spirit's power, saying that God Himself would become a stronghold to those who were faced with hopeless reality, God gave them hope and vision. First point. Two months after sending Haggai, God sent prophet Zechariah also to the temple reconstruction generation. God spoke to the prophet Zechariah. God first spoke to Haggai during the second year of King Darius's reign, on the first day of the six months, and then God spoke to Zechariah during the second year of King Darius on the eighth month. And so we can see that it was about two months after Haggai. Through Zechariah, God told the people to reflect back on the sins of their ancestors. As they had sinned extensively, they received the third step of punishment, which was captivity, as recorded in Leviticus 26, verse 21. And now God told Zechariah to tell the people how they were to live from now on. God stressed that he was the God of all nations three times, and he also stressed that they were to return to him. Three months since God's message to Zechariah, God showed Zechariah eight visions. The reason God showed these visions was in order to reveal how God would restore the people and also Zion. The first five visions symbolized consolation, and the remaining three symbolized judgment. Regarding the first five symbols, the first was a man among the myrtle trees. The second was the four horns and four craftsmen. The third was the man with a measuring line. The fourth was the clean garments for the high priest. And the fifth was the gold lampstand and the two olive trees. The next the three visions symbolized the judgment and they were the flying scroll, the woman in the basket, and four chariots. The first consoling vision was the man among the mortal tree, and when Zechariah saw this, he questioned the man who replied. When God's angel told him that the 70 years had come to an end, the angel told this to Zechariah. God said that the 70 years of captivity was over, and that the people were to return to Jerusalem and restore their temple, and then God would bless them. Indeed, God provided them with warm consolation. The second vision Zechariah saw was the four horns and the four craftsmen, and this symbolized the judgment of the people who attacked South Judah. The second point, God showed visions to Zechariah in order to glorify Jerusalem. The third vision God showed Zechariah was a man with a measuring line. And this symbolized how God would restore Jerusalem and make them glorious again. God continued to speak about Jerusalem's restoration. God declared that Jerusalem would become full of people and animals, and it would become a safe place. God would moreover be with them and dwell among them. This was all the more touching as back in the days of Jeremiah. God had said that he would leave them. The reality of Jerusalem at the point was still beautiful and desolate, but in the vision that Zechariah saw, Jerusalem had become immensely restored with God among them. God told them to rejoice as they and all nations would become God's people. This contained the message of the restored temple, as well as the coming of the Messiah and the kingdom of God. Third point, God purified the high priest Jeshua, Joshua from Satan. The fourth vision God showed to Zechariah was the clean garment for the priest. This symbolized how high priest Joshua would become cleansed. This was a vision of how Joshua had stopped building the temple and was dressed in unclean clothes. However, God was to purify him and he would be able to work again as God's high priest. God also spoke of the branch. 
Now Joshua would become clean and suitable to work for God again. Joshua would oversee God's temple and become a good influence to the people. First point, the fifth vision God gave to Zechariah symbolized the powers he would give to Jerubbabel and Joshua. Now God showed Zechariah the fifth vision. This vision was the gold lampstand and the two olive trees, and this symbolized how God would give powers to Jerubbabel and Joshua. In this vision, there was a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it, with seven channels to the lands. According to Israel's customs, when they raised the kings and priests, the oil was used for anointing, and this symbolized how the anointing came from God. God had particularly anointed Jerubbabel and Joshua. God showed this vision to Zechariah and told him to deliver this message. All in all, this was in order for the temple to be finalized. God told Jerubbabel to be in charge from beginning until the end for God's glory and joy. Thus, the vision of the two olive trees was for Jerubbabel and Joshua. Fifth point, as a sign to symbolize the coming of the Messiah, God crowned the high priest Joshua. The previous five visions symbolized consolation, and the next three visions symbolized judgment. Now God showed Zechariah the sixth vision, and this was the flying scroll. Indeed, this flying scroll symbolized God's judgment. God declared that he would curse the people for their sins, and in particular pointed out the sins of stealing and lying. God then showed Zechariah the seventh vision of the woman in the basket, and this symbolized how the nation's sins would become cleansed. A basket is used for collecting crops. When God judged an evil woman, she tried to escape from it. But then God covered the basket with a top, and this symbolized that God's judgment could not be reversed. However, God later moved the basket to Shina. Shina was the place that appeared in Genesis, the place which was full of evil and arrogance, and where the people had tried to raise the Babel Tower. This symbolized how God would judge the sins of South Judah and then move the judgment to Shina. This moreover showed that Jerusalem would be made holy. And now God showed Zechariah the final vision, the vision of the four chariots. And this showed that the whole world would be judged. The chariots ran towards the whole earth. God later crowned the high priest Joshua with the king's crown. This symbolized the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Through these visions, God aimed to encourage the temple reconstruction generation who had become carefree about the fact that the temple restoration project had come to a halt. Day 269, Zechariah 7 to 10. Why did the Messiah enter riding on a donkey? The promise that the streets of Jerusalem and the city would be restored, and God would live there with faithfulness and justice was joy produced to the returned community. First point, the people from Bethel inquired the priests and the prophets about the fasting during the fifth month. God showed Zechariah eight visions, and then approximately two years later, people from Bethel came to ask the priests and the prophets whether they had to mourn and fast on the fifth month as they had done for many years. The people of Bethel, since 586 BC, when the Babylonians burned down the Jerusalem temple, had come on the fifth month every year to mourn and fast, and now they asked whether they were to continue. With the temple reconstruction project progressing, they were lost as to what they were to do. 
Regarding this question, God provided four answers to the returned captives. The first answer was a rebuke against their hypocrisy. God told them that the fasting and mourning had not been for God but for themselves. God furthermore told them that they had neglected the warnings of the prophets. Fasting and praying is supposed to be for God, not for show. But the people of South Judah fasted for themselves. During the period of Babylon captivity, the people fasted every fifth month and seventh month. However, God rebuked them for their surface level prayers and how their intentions were to satisfy their own religious needs more so than anything else. God instead asked them who they prayed to. In God's second answer, He made them reflect back on their sins and repent. The people had neither kept the laws nor listened to the warnings of the prophet. God had spoken through Moses, Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Micah. But the people did not listen and thus God's anger burned against them. Ultimately, that was the reason for their punishment. God punished them for 70 years as they had not listened to God, and thus their lands became desolate during this time. Second point, God told Zechariah that fasting would turn into joy. God's third answer continued. God requested the people to obey him in return for their restoration. God first outlined the promise for their restoration. On the day of restoration, the reconstruction of the temple would be carried out, and it will mark the days for the coming of the kingdom of God. First, God was to restore the Jerusalem city walls. Second, God was to give long lives to the people of Israel and enable them to live safely within their city walls. Third, God would restore the returned captives and his people. Fourth, God would restore the temple. Fifth, God would restore their lands and make it abundant. Zechariah passed this message of God to the returned captives and persuaded them that God's vision was in Jerusalem. Of course, this was not all to happen immediately but gradually. The temple restoration symbolized the restoration of Israel as well as God's salvation for the restoration of the captives. As such, God promised the restoration of Israel. In return, God requested the people to obey His commands. God's fourth answer proceeded, and this was that fasting would turn into a festival of joy. The news that the lords and walls of Jerusalem would be restored was the best news for the people at the time. God furthermore promised that all nations would believe and obey in God. Third point, through Zechariah, God declared his judgment to the surrounding countries of Israel. God told Zechariah the sins of the surrounding countries of Israel. First was judgment against Damascus, Hadra, Tyre, and Sidon. God spoke against the five cities of Philistine and the judgment against them. Even in the middle of this, God promised the protection of Israel. God promised to protect the returned captives against their enemies and to always look out for them. This was because they were his people. First point, the Messiah would come humbly riding a donkey. Zechariah proclaimed the king who would save the world. This was the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. The Messiah would come as the king and save all nations. The Messiah would come humbly riding a donkey. The Messiah would enter Jerusalem riding a donkey. The Messiah would bring peace. The Messiah would rule over the whole world. The Messiah would save all those who are trapped. The Messiah would be victorious. The Messiah would save his people and make them shine bright. 
the Messiah would bring abundant blessing. Fifth point, God told Zechariah that the Messiah would bring stability to the nation. God told Zechariah to rely on the Almighty God. God declared that he would judge the liars who spoke about the Messiah's salvation. God furthermore declared that he would punish those who made false accusations and those who led the people in wrong directions. God declared the Messiah who would come and change this. All the tribes of Israel would be saved from God's salvation, and the words proclaimed by Ezekiel would be fulfilled. Now God proclaimed through Zechariah that all the Israelites who were scattered would come together to be saved. As such, Zechariah saw many visions and heard many prophecies from God. Zechariah helped the returned captives to see God's vision and to have hope. God gave the people new courage and promised that He would be with them. Day 270, Zechariah 11 to 14, Festival of Tabernacles kept by Lamnantis. God, who did not give up Israel to the end, held on to the returned community with endless love and threw his arms around them. First point, God told Zechariah that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. During the times Zechariah ministered, it was common sense that the sheep to be slaughtered was not fed beforehand. But God told Zechariah to feed the sheep that were to be slaughtered. In other words, God told Zechariah to take care of sheep that were soon to die. Zechariah obeyed God. He obeyed God's command, which went against the common sense of the time. God explained that although God took care of and loved his sheep, they in return were not grateful and despised their shepherd. This was a warning that although Jesus would come to take care of his sheep, they would despise him. This was also a reference to Judas Iscariot. God declared that the Israelites who refused and rejected God would be punished. Eventually, the Israelites who rejected the Messiah would be punished and scattered throughout the earth, but the remnants would be saved. God spoke to Zechariah about the false shepherds who would cause pain to his people. The false shepherd would not go to look for his lost sheep and not tend his sick sheep. However, this false shepherd would be punished by God in the end. Second point. God proclaimed that on that day, the people would lament and repent. God declared that although the surrounding countries would come to attack Jerusalem, God would protect his people and save them. Jerusalem was the place selected by God through David to house God's ark. It was Jerusalem that God judged. But after 70 years passed and the people served their punishment, God was to lift them up again. In time, God promised to protect them and to be with them. This was the consoling message God gave to the people through Zechariah. God told Zechariah that he would protect the Israelites from their enemies. God declared that he would make Jerusalem a cup that would send all the surrounding peoples reeling. God said that he would make Jerusalem an immovable rock and also would strike every horse with panic and his rider with madness. Furthermore, God would make the clans of Judah like a fire fort in a wood fire, like a flaming torch among sheaves. God proclaimed that on that day, the people would receive an enormous amount of power from God. The people were to repent for their sins and experience the new glory of Jerusalem. God would take care of the sheep that even the shepherd disposed of, and God would make a new history with and through them. Now God spoke of the repentance of the people. 
third point, God told Zechariah about how the Messiah would suffer and how the people would be protected. God told Zechariah that the people would become purified from their sins. Moreover, idols, false prophets, and dirty ghosts would disappear. The Messiah, however, would suffer for the people's sins, for the people to receive God's protection. God went on to explain how suffering would come upon Christians towards the end of the earth. On that day, two thirds will be struck down and perish. Fourth point, God told Zechariah of the Lord's day that he also told to Isaiah, Amos, Jephaniah, Joel, and Ezekiel. A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. God had proclaimed the coming of that day to Isaiah, Amos, Jephaniah, Joel, and Ezekiel. God once again repeated this message to Zechariah. On the Lord's day, darkness would fade, and the spring of water would flow, and all of God's people would be at peace. This message was also recorded in Revelation. On that day, all those who attacked God's people would be cursed. Their flesh will decay, they will fight among themselves, and they will lose their possessions. Fifth point, the Lamnantis would remain to keep God's festival. God now spoke of the victory of the kingdom of the Messiah. The Lamnantis would be able to keep the holy festivals, and those who are not among them would be cursed. All would become purified on the Lord's day. The messages related to the Messiah that God told Zechariah were the following. Branch, seven-eyed stone, the priest, humble king, cornerstone, tent peg, battle bow and ruler, the thirty pieces of silver, the pierced man, cleansing from sin, and so on. Day 271, Ezra 5-6, to Jerubbabel's Temple. The people who were energized through the rebuke and encouragement of Haggai and Zechariah finally finished rebuilding the temple and experienced great joy. First point, through Haggai and Zechariah's encouragement, the Jerusalem Temple Reconstruction Project began again. The Temple Reconstruction Project, which had come to a stop for 16 years, finally resumed. However, they were faced with more obstacles. Tatenai, the governor, sent a letter to Darius and tried his best to legally stop this project, but no one could stop God's vision or plan. Second point, the Persian King Darius carefully checked the report written by the governor of the west of the Euphrates River concerning the Jerusalem Temple Reconstruction Project. The reasons the governor sent a letter to Darius were the following. The first was because he wanted to know who had commanded this project. The second was because of the answer the returned captives gave to his question. The elders of Israel answered that they were the servants of God and admitted that South Judah had fallen because of their sins. The third was because they wanted to check whether this project had actually been decreed by Cyrus of Persia. When Darius received this letter, he started the investigation and found a scroll in the archives stored in the treasury in Babylon. The main point written in Cyrus's decree was first that Cyrus himself indeed commanded the temple reconstruction project. The second was that the funding for this project was to be given by the Persian Empire. The third was that all the objects taken by Nebuchadnezzar to the temple was to be returned to Jerusalem. Third point, King Darius of Persia commanded the governor of the west of the Euphrates that the Jerusalem temple reconstruction project would be funded by tax money. 
After discovering the decree of Cyrus, Darius gave an order not to disturb the temple reconstruction project and to furthermore assist them. Darius commanded that the funding for this project was to be carried out by tax. The offerings for the Jerusalem temple would also be funded by Persia. The Persian Empire knew that the Jews were a nation who prayed to God, and so this was to ensure that they would pray for the kings and the princes of Persia in the newly restored temple. Darius, moreover, commanded that anyone who rebelled against this would be thoroughly punished. As such, the temple reconstruction project, which had been stopped for 16 years, was begun again with the support of Darius. Fourth point, the temple reconstruction project came to a stop for 16 years, but then it took four years for it to be completed once it started again. Eventually, the Jerusalem temple was restored. The project was supported and funded by the Persian Empire, and so the whole procedure was abundantly carried out. The prophets Haggai and Zechariah also were crucial people in this project. And now the temple was ready to be used for offering to God. Although the scale and ceremony of the offering was much smaller compared to the one done by Solomon all those years ago, it was still a marvelous sight. The fact that Israel could come before God and make an offering again was enough. The fact that the returned captives could keep Passover again was like re-establishing a kingdom of priests. Fifth point, the Persian Empire helped with the temple reconstruction project and at the same time they burned down Babylon. Whilst the Jerusalem temple was being restored, the opposite was happening in Babylon. When Persia came to attack Babylon during the reign of Cyrus, the Babylonians willingly opened their doors, but when Darius reigned, Babylonians suddenly closed their gates and claimed that they wished to be independent. Thus, Darius took his soldiers and tried to attack. However, due to the Babylon walls being indestructible, the Persians were stuck outside. After some scheming, the Babylonians eventually opened their gates. The returned captives who were in Babylon for 70 years would have realized God's plan whilst seeing this. Day 272, Esther 1 to 5. Esther threatens towards the Jews. Esther devised a plan to save her nation by trusting in God as Haman tried to annihilate the Jews in Persia. First point, before setting out to the third war between Persia and Greek city-states, Queen Vashti was dethroned in the middle of the six months long party that was held to raise spirit. The story of the beautiful Queen Esther has quite the backstory to how it all began. King Xerxes ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. Xerxes had a party for six months with his officials and nobles in order to prepare for the battle against the Greek city-states. It was during this time that the incident with Queen Bashiti occurred. Bashiti was called to the party, but when she rejected this request, the king became angry and consequently disowned her. The king's servant, Memu Khan, provided the king with legal measures. This was all in order to earn extra points from the king. Jaxis, hearing this, took his servant's advice and made official that Bashiti was no longer the queen. It was also made law that the wives had to honor and respect their husbands from their own. Second point, after choosing Esther as his queen, the king granted tax exemptions as a sign of joy. After dethroning Vashiti, a quest began to find a new queen. 
beautiful women from all over Persia were examined and Xerxes was happy about this. It was here that Mordecai and Esther appeared. Mordecai was likely a descendant of those taken to Babylon during the second round of captivity and was from the tribe of Benjamin. At last, the decree in Persia became released. Here, Esther became the new queen. Xerxes was over the moon about his new queen, that he granted tax exemptions as a sign of his joy. This was indeed the best service any ruler could provide for his people. Time passed, and when Mordecai found out about the king's assassination, he warned the king through Esther. Because of this, Mordecai's name was documented in the royal records. This became an important historical record for the Jews in the time to come. As such, the Persians were very careful and thorough about making their records. Third point, Haman, who was a descendant of the Amalekites, abused the decree of the king to plan a massacre against the Jews. It is not certain how Haman, a descendant of the Amalekites, came to be promoted as a high-ranking official. But he was indeed in a superior position, and he abused this to his own advantage. There was a man who did not bow down to him, and this was Mordecai. Haman, therefore, could not stand that Mordecai did not show respect to him, and so decided to wipe out all the Jews. Haman started to scheme for his revenge. This involved targeting the Jews. In the twelfth month, he was to wipe them from the earth. He also told the king lies about the Jews and their laws. He completely abused the system of the Persian Empire. He lured the Persian king to think in the way he wanted him to think. He furthermore promised to provide the king with 10,000 pieces of silver as a bribe. To Xerxes, this deal was only for gaining profit. Xerxes, fooled by Haman's scheme, provided him with the power to write the decree. Haman therefore announced the decree to kill the Jews and to wipe them from earth. For the Jews, this was the biggest danger for them since coming to Persia. When this decree became officially announced, the Jews were in a state of shock and panic. Haman, who felt victorious and smitten, was overjoyed and waited for a good time. He was extremely happy at the thought of gaining the wealth of the Jews, on top of getting his way. First point, before asking for the king's help, Esther first asked for God's help by fasting for three days. After the decree was released, all the Jews lamented loudly. The price Mordecai had to pay for not honoring Haman was horrendous. Mordecai tore his robes and also lamented bitterly. The only one who could save them now was God. Mordecai turned to Esther and asked her to fight for them. But Esther also had her own circumstances. This was none other than that she was not permitted to go see the king before she was called. This could cost her life, and even the queen could be suspected of trying to assassinate the king if she turned up uninvited. Despite this, Mordecai still requested to Esther to go seek the king. Esther made up her mind. She asked her people to fast with her for three days and to pray to God with her. Esther prepared to die after three days. She had not been called for 30 days by the king, meaning that her position had become less attractive. But she decided that if she perished, she would perish. Fifth point, in order to fight against Haman, Esther planned her party. After fasting for three days, Esther went before the king. Surprisingly, Jaxis welcomed her and opened his heart to her. He moreover told her that he would grant her any request. Indeed, God had granted her prayers. 
Jaxis was in such a good mood that he told her that he would give her half his kingdom if she desired. Writer Harold also used this line. Esther used her wish chance to invite the king and the Haman to her party, and so began Esther's first party. Jaxis offered her another wish chance, and she used this to invite the king and the Haman to her second party. They both promised to attend. When Haman was invited to both parties, he felt very good about himself. He went back home and schemed to kill Mordecai before killing the Jews. He felt asleep most smitten that he had been invited to the queen's party. Day 273, Esther 6 to 10. The Festival of Purim and Mordecai. The thirteenth day of the month of Adar, which almost became the most tragic day for the Jews, turned into the Feast of Purim as they praised God for the joy and victory. First point. The night before Esther's second party, God made the Jaxis read the records. The night before Esther's second party, Jaxis could not fall asleep and so read the historical records. Jaxis came across the record where Mordecai reported the assassin, finding out that he did not express gratitude for this. Jaxis ordered Haman to find a way to thank someone whom the king wished to honor. Haman believed that the king could only have been talking about himself and thus replied that the king should reward him with royal robes, the king's own horse, and to have him parade the streets to show the people how a king treats his trusted servants. Haman was most shocked to hear that the person Jaxis wanted to honor was not him but Mordecai whom he wished to kill. This day became a glorious day for Mordecai and an embarrassing day for Haman. Haman went home in great fury. He told his wife and friends, and they were unable to hide their bad gut feeling. At that point, the king's servants came to pick Haman up to attend Esther's party. Haman did not even have time to take a pain class for his headache before attending Esther's party. Second point, in the second party, Esther revealed to the king and Haman that she was a Jew. When Jaxis went to Esther's second party, he once again told her that he would give her half the kingdom. She led the king on to ensure that he would listen to her actual wish. And now she started to say what she had intended to say. She revealed that Haman was trying to kill her and her people. Esther started speaking to the king. She firstly asked him to save her life. She secondly asked him to save her people from being murdered. She thirdly pointed out that if her people were killed, that would be a loss to the king's military and economic power. Esther then pointed out clearly that this was all the scheme of Haman. At this, Jaxis became very angry and had to leave the room to cool down. He came back to see that Haman was grabbing onto Esther's cloth whilst begging for his life. This ensured that Haman was sentenced to death for attempting to rape the queen. Third point, Esther requested to Jaxis to withdraw the decree of killing the Jews. The king, who felt betrayed by Haman, went ahead and killed him. By hanging him on the pole, Haman had initially set up to kill Mordecai, and only then managed to come down. Esther stood in front of the king again. She went to him in order to make him withdraw the decree of officially being allowed to kill the Jews. Once again, she went to him with her life on the line. The act of withdrawing a decree was deeply involved with the king's prestige and reputation, and thus this was virtually impossible. We remember that Daniel also experienced a similar situation under the Persian Empire. 
which meant that against the king's will. The king's decree meant that he still had to go into the lion's den. The power of the king's decree can also be seen in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah. Knowing all this, Esther still went before the king to make him withdraw the decree. Fourth point, through the three days of fasting and her two parties, Esther managed to make the king sign another decree and was given permission to use his finest horses. Despite how Esther requested the unthinkable, Jaxis granted her request by granting her the right to sign another decree that overruled the previous one. Indeed, the unthinkable had happened in the Persian Empire. A new decree became released and things had to move swiftly in order to make sure that the new decree was not too late. The royal secretaries were summoned on the 23rd day of the third month. They wrote out all of Mordecai's order to the Jews and to the satraps, governors and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These scripts were written in the script of each province and the language of each people. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves. The Jews were able to live and furthermore keep their property. Fifth point, in order to celebrate their lives, the Jews made the festival of Purim, where they shared with their neighbors. The new edict of Jaxis meant that the Jews were able to free themselves from their enemies. Due to this, the status of Mordecai was raised high above. Moreover, the Persians cooperated with the Jews. The Jews were able to win against Haman. The Jews destroyed their enemies. However, they did not put their hands on their possessions. Due to the confiscating of Haman's houses, Jaxis' royal treasury would have become even wealthier. Jaxis issued another edict. Mordecai then wrote two letters to the diaspora Jews. The letters contained the message for them to observe and keep the festival of purity. This became a festival in a kingdom of priests whereby the Jews made it customary to look after the poor and weak in society. As for the Persian Empire, despite losing all three battles against Greece, they received tribute from 127 provinces and therefore became the Empire of Gold. Mordecai's records became the official records in this Empire of Gold. Thanks to Mordecai, the whole Jewish nation became respected within the Persian Empire.